Hello, 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 everybody, and welcome to my Call Time Limited set review. Today, I'm going to be going through all of the commons and uncommons in Call Time and talking about them to get you ready for your own Call Time drafts. Before I dive in, I want to remind you that if you enjoy this video, be sure to hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment in the comment section down below. You're not going to want to miss all of the call time content coming your way, and all those things really do help me out. And if you would like to support my content directly, you can do so via the Patreon, patreon.com slash Nikolai Bolas. And as a uh, perk for being a patron, you'll get access to my call time card by card grade spreadsheet. So if you like this sort of information, but in a spreadsheet form, then becoming a patron is a great way to get access to that. Without further ado, let's dive into the grading scale. Starting things off with A's, those are the bombs, the hyper-efficient spells, uh, the cards that you're going to be taking pretty much pack one, pick one. Unfortunately, commons and uncommons are generally not A's, or it would be pretty imbalanced. So there's no A's in the commons and uncommons. Moving on to the B's, these are active pulls into a color. These are the cards that make you want to draft that particular color or archetype. C's are solid playables. These are cards you're happy to put in your deck, but they're nothing too special. D's are filler. You're usually going to have a couple of these in your deck. F's are unplayables. And then there are two bonus types. There are sideboard cards that are only good out of the sideboard, but they get a special grade because some cards are just especially good out of the sideboard. And then there are build arounds, which need some extra work to be strong, but if you put in the work to support them, they can be quite good. Before I talk about the cards, though, I do also want to say that what I say about the card is more important than the actual grade because a lot of cards might fall into the camp of C or uh, C plus. That's like a pretty classic range, C's and C pluses. But the nuance of the card is really important because a card might be a C plus in one deck and much worse in another deck or something of that nature. Okay, doke. So starting things off with white, we have X guard braggart. Uh, I'm not really going to be reading the cards because the picture is right here and it's just a lot of extra words. But essentially Axe Guard Braggart is going to be just a solid C. Uh, the fact that it untaps means that you can play defense with it pretty well so it fits nicely into a control deck. It fits decently into an aggressive deck as well because you're just attacking, untapping, and then you have a 4-4 on defense and you're attacking them with a 4-4. So I think that's going to be a pretty nice recipe and it's just a rock solid common that you're going to be pretty happy to play in your deck. And if there's any boast synergies, you're pretty happy with that as well. Next up is Batter Shield Warrior. I also gave this card a C. And uh, the reason being is that generally the way you're going to play this card is towards the end of your curve. You're not really going to want to go turn three, play this, and then turn four, attack, and activate it. You might have to play it on turn three if you don't have anything else to play. But what's generally going to happen is you're going to want to use this to swing in with a wide board of creatures or like three or four creatures and give them all plus one plus one because then it attacks as a three three and it's pretty uh, difficult to deal with uh, there could also be situations where you go two drop th then play this and then attack activate the boast and then play another two drop those could be good situations um, so if your deck is really built to maximize it it could maybe be a little bit better than a c but i think in most cases it's going to just function a pretty average next is battlefield raptor this card is a little bit uh, of a trap sometimes because uh, people just love one mana cards but a one mana one two flyer even with first strike is just generally not that good if you have some equipments or auras that are good that you want to be putting on your creatures uh, you can sometimes have good curve outs with this but generally it's going to be like a d unless the first strike is really relevant and there's a lot of x ones running around in which case uh, you'll either be relatively happy playing it as like a d plus or c minus type card or it could come out of the sideboard if your opponent has a lot of x ones Next is Best Gear Shieldmate. I think this card's pretty good. It's going to be probably on the higher end of the C range. I don't know if it quite gets into C+, but a 2-1 that dies into a 1-1 is just a pretty good bargain, so you're going to be happy playing this in your aggressive decks. Uh, it just trades off pretty well because a 1-1 body, uh, beh leaving that behind is going to be pretty relevant a lot of the time. Next is Bound in Gold. Uh, I think this is going to be probably a B- in terms of white cards. It's a pretty solid removal spell. There are ways to get rid of enchantments and artifacts in the set, but they're not that uh, common, and so it, and there's not a ton of bounce spells or anything like that, so it's probably going to consistently take out the creature you want to take out, and stopping activated abilities and crewing is actually a pretty big deal, because there are vehicles in this set, so it's just a pretty nice removal spell for white, and my early front runner for top white common, just a pretty good uh, removal spell all around, and one you're going to be happy putting in your deck, I think it's probably like a B- minus on the scale. Next is Clarion Spirit. I think this is also probably a B minus. It's just a two drop that's going to get you a little bit of incremental value over the course of the game. It might not look like much, but a spirit token with flying is actually going to be a pretty nice body a lot of the time. And the way that uh, 
the card works is if you play it on turn two over the course of the game if they don't kill it you might get like two or three like two spirits or something like that and that's just a really good card like a two mana two one that makes you i mean i mean a two mana two two that just get makes you a couple spirits is just a really good deal so i think this is probably going to be a b minus a card that every white deck's going to want next is code spell cleric it could be a key component in decks that care about casting multiple spells in a turn i actually think it's going to be a c as a result of that um maybe even can go up to a c a little bit higher like a c plus in certain decks just because being able to have a cheap one mana play that's actually a relevant body like a one one that puts a counter somewhere is just a pretty reasonable card you're generally happy paying like two mana for that effect so if you can consistently be triggering it or like if you go two drop then play this it's gonna be pretty good especially if you're triggering some of your spells matters cards so it's a little bit finicky to use so i gave it i think it's gonna be probably like a c but it definitely has some cool potential and upside uh, and in certain archetypes. Next is Divine Gambit. This card's really tricky to evaluate, but I ended up settling on like C minus to reflect the fact that it's pretty narrow. You generally aren't going to cast it in the early game, but if you and your opponent are kind of both approaching top deck mode or you're in a stalled out game, then it's going to be like a really good removal spell for only two mana. It can also help you double spell because it's so cheap. And uh, it's a little bit different when your opponent's putting the permanent into play from their hand because it's not like they're like shuffling their library and then flipping the top card. Uh, so you are not actually getting like two for one or anything. They're just getting a slight mana advantage if they do get to put something sizable into play. But overall, I think it's probably going to be a C minus. If you're in a con if you're an aggressive deck, you're not going to want it because if you use it to take out a blocker, they could just put in a bigger blocker. But in a controlling deck, I could see playing a copy and it being pretty solid. Next is Doomscar Oracle. I think this is another just pretty rock solid card. Uh, it works pretty well for helping you cast a second spell due to Fortell uh, being a, a, like its Fortell cost only being a single mana. Uh, so you can go like uh, play your normal spell, then pay this for only one mana and get your second spell. Uh, unfortunately, it won't trigger on itself. I don't believe <laughs> you can't like cast this as your second spell and gain the two life. But if you go like four four delves for one mana, cast another spell, you'll gain two life, which is quite nice. And uh, it's just a reasonable stat line. So I think it's going to be a C, but it could overperform in some archetypes. Next up is Giant Ox. This is a really cute design. It's pretty decent in control decks uh, if you just need a big blocker. And being able to crew vehicles is nice because there are some pretty high crew cost vehicles. Uh, generally, it's just going to be a D, though. A lot of decks aren't going to want it. If you want to attack, you're not really going to care about this unless you have an, a large number of high crew cost vehicles. But it's a pretty good uh, blocker for if you're a control deck. Next is God's Hall Guardian. I think this is also going to be a C, even though typically this sort of stat line would be like a D plus. And the reason I think that is because in uh, the format, if you go like put this face down on turn two and then I'll just play a four mana three six on turn four, that's just really good. This one really benefits from splitting up the cost because a six mana three six vigilance isn't great, but a four mana three six vigilance is pretty absurd. It's going to just brick wall a lot of your aggressive opponents and, uh, as a, as a result of that, it's going to be a pretty solid card, I think. Moving on to Gold Maw Champion. Not a huge fan of this. It's probably just a C- minus or a D-plus level card because you're not often going to be able to tap the creature while developing your curve out. So you're going to have to just save this until the late game where they might have multiple blockers. That being said, it's probably still just a C- minus because a 3-mana 2-3 doesn't need all that much to become a reasonable card. But generally not as good as it maybe looks based on previous cards that have been able to tap your opponent's creatures next is invoke the divine this is just a straight up sideboard card it can take out the sagas that your opponents might have it can take out the artifacts uh that your that your opponent might be uh having in their deck that you might not have uh, been able to expect in game one so i don't think it's really main deckable but it's a pretty reasonable sideboard card next is iron verdict uh this card is just a C in my opinion, not because it's uh, bad or inefficient, but mostly because aggressive decks aren't going to love this card and control decks will love it. So you kind of split the difference and give it a C, but in a control deck, it's like a C plus, And in an aggro deck, it's like a C minus because um, if you're a control deck, having the ability to foretell this early and then hold it up for a single white mana is really good. Uh, and it can be exactly what you want. But if you are an aggressive deck, your opponent's creatures are all going to be untapped. Uh, while you're trying to beat them down and so you're not going to like really love having this card even though it's probably still going to be fine to play a copy because you're not always going to be on the front foot as an aggro deck next is kaya's onslaught i think this card's going to end up being a d plus or a c minus it's 
if you pay it for the three mana part, it's just relatively clunky. It can do some cool things. Uh, there was a card that was like this back in, I think, Shadows over Innistrad that uh, I think it was called like Untamed Fury or something. And it was actually a pretty reasonable kill condition, especially if you combine it with another pump spell. But there's not like another massive pump spell in white like that gives plus two, plus two or something like that. Um, I guess there's a there's one that gives plus two, plus one to everything that we'll get to. Uh, but there's not like a card that gives plus three, plus oh, and then you combine it with this to like hit them for eight out of nowhere, uh, which is a sort of combo that you could maybe assemble in other formats with this card. Uh, the ability to hold it up for a single white mana is pretty reasonable, but giving the creature only plus one, plus one means that it's a little bit more narrow in what it's going to be killing. Uh, because if you, you have to like specifically be attacking like into a creature with only one toughness more, it's not going to help your like, it's not going to help your three, two, take out a two, five. Uh, no, I mean, uh, I take out like a three, three, eh, I guess it will help it take out a two, five, but generally it, it's a little bit more narrow because sometimes a combat trick will be like plus three plus oh in first strike or plus two plus two. And, uh, this is often going to function similar to those. I got a little derailed on this card, but I think it's just going to be like a mediocre combat trick because it's a little bit clunky to use. And so probably a D plus or a C minus depending on your deck. Next is master scald. I think this is going to be a rock solid C. It's just a really cool card. Um, by turn five, you're generally going to have a creature card in your graveyard. So that part's a little bit less of a concern than it would be on some of the other cards in the format that have that little line of text, the exile a creature from your graveyard. And uh, there are some enchantments that you're going to want to get back in the form of sagas. And there are some artifact creatures and things like that that you can put in if you have a master scald. So this is going to be a C and it can even go to a C plus if you have some good sagas to get back. Next is revitalize. Just a pretty typical D level card. You don't really care about having revitalize in your deck but it can be a niche playable if you need it and sometimes if you're trying to cast two spells in a turn it might be something that you need just to replace itself next is rune of sustenance probably just going to be a c level card i will say with all of the runes it's generally going to be nice if you can put these onto an equ equipment because then you can just spread the uh extra benefit around to all of your creatures as they die off but it's there's not as many good equipments in this set as you might think so uh, i think you're generally going to end up putting it on a creature you're going to want to make sure that the coast is clear before because you don't want to get blown out but generally pretty nice to give a creature lifelink especially if it's a big creature next is shepherd of the cosmos i think this is going to be a c plus level card just pretty reasonable effect and uh you're oftentimes just like that massive cat the three six you're going to be casting this for foretell all, a lot of the time because splitting up the cost is going to be really nice over the course of a couple turns and then you just get back your two drop which is nice and uh, a three three flyer is a pretty reasonable body so i think shepherd's a pretty nice card next is spectral steel this is a really interesting design because i think that it's generally going to be worse than it looks i would I think it's going to be like a D level card just because the base effect isn't very good. If it had a better effect, uh, then being able to like use it to get back other auras or equipments would be nice. But the thing is, is in limited generally, first of all, equipments aren't generally going to the graveyard. So that line is a little bit uh, less useful. And second of all, uh, there's not a ton of other auras that you're going to be playing that are going to be necessarily going to the graveyard because the removal spell in white, that's an aura is generally going to be staying on the battlefield and the, uh, like other auras aren't particularly great. So I don't think you're generally going to be uh, using this to get a lot of card advantage. And the problem is, is that it's, it's base effect isn't very good. So if you're playing it to get back other enchantments, then you're basically playing a bad card to get back other cards some portion of the time. And that's just not great. So I think this card's a little bit weak, probably going to be a D though. It gets a little bit of a boost if you have aura synergies. Next is Stalwart Valkyrie. I think this is another just rock solid C. A lot of the time it's going to be hard to cast it for cheap early on in the game. And so by the time you're casting it for only two, mat two mana, it's not going to matter as much, uh, which means that you kind of have to evaluate this as a four mana three, two uh, that has a little bit of upside. So a four mana three, two flyer would probably be like a C minus or a C. And so this is like a C that trends a little bit closer to C plus because casting it for two mana can be relevant, especially if you're trying to double spell, but it's by no means like incredible upside. Next is Starnheim Corsair. This is just a, basically a three mana two, two flyer. Uh, the extra text is a little bit irrelevant at times. So it's just going to be a C level card. Next is Story Seeker. Two mana two, two lifelink is sometimes a really good card in the format and sometimes just a solid card in the format. It's never really like a terrible card. So I think this is just going to be a rock solid C. And if it's anything other than that, it's going to be a little bit better, probably uh, depending on how aggressive the format is, uh, because this is just a pretty decent stat line and uh, having lifelink is nice. Next is Usher of the Fallen. I think this is going to be a B minus level card. Just it's a cheap play that kind of 
can get you some advantage so you play it on turn one next turn you attack make another and you can either use the boast ability or play another two drop i think in most cases you're going to want to use the boast ability because eventually it's not going to be able to attack so you'll miss out on that value uh, but having a one mana two one that gives you a little bit of extra value is pretty nice so especially because on turn one you often don't have a way to spend your mana so i think it's going to be a b minus or a c plus if you're not an aggressive deck it's obviously going to get a pretty decent knock against it uh because it, it's just gonna be blocking in that case which is still decent but not great valkyrie sword is next i give this card a c plus uh grade because it just costs so much you're generally really not going to want to just use it to make an equipment because it's a really inefficient equipment so it's essentially a seven drop which a lot of decks aren't going to be able to play and uh even though it is a powerful creature it's like a seven mana six five flying with vigilance that's like a pretty massive creature but the problem is is a lot of decks aren't going to be able to get to seven mana so i'm going to get a c plus if you're a more mid-rangey deck it's going to be really perfect for you next is valor of the worthy i gave this a d plus it's not terrible because it just says if the creature leaves the battlefield uh so if it gets bounced or you like something like that it's gonna you still give you the one one flyer and a one one flyer it is a like decent card uh, but generally this is just a really low impact spell so I think I would only really be playing it if I had some aura synergies uh, giving a creature plus one plus one is pretty minor especially because there is the downside of your opponent just using enchantment removal on your creature and all of a sudden you've got this valor that can't ever die so I think it's probably going to be a D plus or a D depending on whether you have other synergies next is warhorn blast this is a nice little anthem of uh, like big uh, pump spell it's probably a like a little bit worse than Inspired Charge, which is like the same effect, but costs two white, white. It's a little bit easier to cast on the turn where you care about it, but in the decks where you're trying to go wide, you don't really want to be taking, spending two mana to like take the turn off and then do it the next turn. So you're often going to be casting it for five mana in that sort of deck because like you'll top deck this, attack them with everything and pay five mana. Uh, so I they just think this is probably going to be a D plus card or C minus if you have some uh, go wide synergies. There are some cards that make multiple bodies for one card, and so it gets better if you have that sort of card in your deck. Next is Wings of the Cosmos. Uh, this card reminds me of uh, Sudden Spinnerets from Ikoria, which was plus one plus three, and you give a reach counter to your creature and you untap it. But this is a little bit better than that because giving a creature flying unlocks the upside of uh, flying over for like lethal at the final stages of the game so what this can do is it can either win you a combat in the early game for a cheap amount of mana plus one plus three is a little bit more niche than like a plus two plus two because it isn't as isn't isn't always going to help you take out the creature but your creature is usually going to survive so it's just it's, it gets better if you have bigger creatures that they might want to double block or things like that but then in the late game if the board is stalled out and they don't have a like flyer or something then you can top deck wings of the cosmos uh cast it on your like five five and all of a sudden you're hitting them for six in the air and finishing them off so it gets a little bit of a boost for that i think it's going to be like a c minus level card because of that moving on to blue starting things off with a null we have i think just it's going to be a sideboard card it's just pretty narrow but if they have some artifacts or enchantments that are really good like some really good saga or something you're going to potentially be bringing this in because it is pretty cheap and uh you can get a nice mana advantage if they like tap four for their sweet saga and you counter it for one so decent sideboard card next is augury raven i think it's gonna be a c plus a four mana three three is already just a good a four mana three three flyer shall i say is already a good card and having foretell tacked on gives it some nice extra upside uh so i think this is gonna be a c plus just level card just rock solid Next is Avalanche Caller. I'm a big fan of this card. I don't know exactly why, but it just really appeals to me. So I, I had to rein myself in from giving this a B. I think it's going to be a B minus. Uh, but the ability to just have a cheap blocker that then threatens to activate. Um, I often I, th I think that oftentimes you're not going to want to be attacking with those creatures. But the way it can work is on your opponent's turn, you hold up your mana. So say you play Avalanche Caller, then on turn three you do something else. And then on turn four, you pass with all your mana up. And you have uh, a four mana instant there I'll get to in a, a little bit. But there's a four mana instant in blue that scries you two and draws you two cards or something like that. And so you pass with four mana up and your opponent can't really attack you because they have like their three three but they know that you'll just make a four four and eat their creature so they can't really attack you and so the threat of activation which means that the uh, the mere fact that you could activate your avalanche caller means your opponent can't really attack you uh and then you can just pay, play your four mana spell i will say that you have to prioritize snowlands to make this good because if you don't have enough snowlands to reliably 
make a snow land into a four four then it's going to be like a two mana one three which isn't great but if you have like five snow lands in your deck or four snow lands in your deck even it's going to be pretty reasonable because all you really need is one snow land in play to make this card a pretty scary threat um so yeah i think it's going to be a b minus but it gets a little worse if you don't have enough snow lands next is behold the merchant from multiverse the exact card i was talking about i didn't know exactly when it came up in the uh, order there but uh, this is the exact card i was talking about it's going to be really good i think this is a b minus level card which may seem weird for a card draw spell but this is very very powerful scry two, draw two is really nice the ability to foretell it is also really good because in an earlier you you generally don't need to play your card draw in the early turns unless you're digging for lands and so you can foretell this uh, at your leisure and then in the late game uh, or in the mid game you can cast it for two mana and then potentially play whatever you draw off of it which is going to be a really nice swing uh, if you played during kaladesh uh, there was a called ca card called glimmer of genius which was four mana to scry to and draw to and that card was fantastic for control decks but and i think this card can be really good for mid-range and control blue decks which most blue decks end up somewhere on that spectrum rather than being aggressive so i think this card's going to be really good and it's my contender for top blue common at the moment just really a lot of cards and card selection even for a common and for tells good on it Next up is a Berg Strider. Berg! I like that because it's like you're shivering. I don't know. I think it's kind of funny. I think Berg probably means something in like some language like Berg is like maybe mountain or something. I don't know. But anyway, it's a pretty cool card. I think the fact that it's a giant is nice for some tribal synergies. It being a snow creature can be relevant, but generally it's probably going to be like a C minus level card because a five mana four four is just a little bit inefficient and tapping their creature is not like that high upside. If you reliably are going to have snow mana, it probably goes up to a C. Uh, and by turn five, if you have like four or five snow lands in your deck, you'll probably be tapping the creature uh, for a couple turns. So it goes up to like a C level card then, but some decks and if you have giant synergies it probably goes up to a c level card as well but it's just for a five drop you need a pretty high bar for it to be a great card and berg strider is not like anything special so it's just like a c minus or c level card next is bind the monster which is a really sweet design uh i'm actually a huge fan of the design on this card i love i love cool designs it's one of my favorite things to look at uh but buying the monster for a single mana you tap the creature and then does damage to you so it's like a combination of bubble snare and feed the swarm from zendikar rising which is really cool i think it's going to be a c level card um it works really well with the white card we already looked at the three two that gains you two life for casting a second spell because buying the monster is going to cost you a decent amount of life over the course of the game but if you're gaining two every couple turns then that can, that can help offset it but generally the reason it's only going to be a c is because if you put like three bind the monsters in your deck then you're going to be taking a lot of extra damage and it's going to be hard to uh like cast multiples of them in, unless you have a lot of life gain which is going to be a little bit hard to facilitate sometimes so if you are going to be taking bind the monster prioritize life gain a little bit higher so that maybe you can play multiple copies but i think it's going to be like a c level card it's pretty good uh to cast the first copy but after that it does get a little bit rough especially if you're trying to take out some of their big creatures next is a brine barrow intruder uh this card is a lot like zulaport duelist it doesn't have the mill synergies or the party sub themes which is why i don't think it's going to be too good but it's probably going to be like a c minus level card just because it's a pretty powerful combat trick-esque effect it does really well against x ones it's pretty good against any small creature in the early game to help facilitate a double block and uh for that reason it's probably going to be like a c minus level card even though it it lacks some of the synergy that zulaport duelist had um, it's, it's uh, gonna probably gonna be a C minus or some maybe a D plus, but most likely a C minus level card. You're probably gonna be okay playing the first copy of this in your deck. Next is Depart the Realm. This is a really neat design as well. Uh, two mana to just bounce a permanent, which is pretty reasonable. But then it also has Foretell, so you can get access to this effect for a little bit cheaper, which is nice because uh, sometimes you're just gonna have turns in the mid game where you're not gonna have anything to do with your mana, and so you can just Foretell this, and then all of a sudden your card just gets a little bit better bouncing your thing you can save a creature from removal it doesn't have a restriction on bouncing up just opponent's creatures so you can return your own creatures to your hand you can uh, return your sagas to your hand to re-trigger them uh, what you do is you put the third uh, chapter thing on the stack and then you bounce it to your hand um, and uh, sorry about that and uh, then you get to recast the saga so that's really good so depart the realm is going to be like a c level card but if you have foretell synergies sagas uh, or things of that nature can go up to a C plus uh, pretty easily.
and I think it's a really cool design as well. Uh, I was really, when the cards were being revealed in the set, uh, Depart the Realm was one of the later cards revealed, but I just knew that they had to have a foretell bounce spell because it's going to be really tricky to know what your opponent does. If they foretell a card, it could be a bounce spell, it could be a counter spell, which is an uncommon, it could be a card draw spell, it could be a creature, so lots of cool little options with foretell, which is going to be real fun to see how it plays out. Next is Disdainful Stroke. This is probably going to be a C- minus or D+, plus, uh, depending on how the format shakes out, if there are a lot of expensive cards that matter, which I think there are some that matter for sure. And if it isn't a great main, main deck card, it'll still be a, just a decent sideboard card. Uh, it's just pretty efficient, You and it's also nice because you don't have to worry about holding up your counter in the early game because you know it can't counter anything, and then in the mid game you counter something for two mana, which is nice. It does play pretty well with Foretell because if you have the Behold the Universe or whatever the card draw one is called and you're holding that up for two mana, you can also hold up Disdainful Stroke, which gives it a little boost. So I think it's probably going to play out like a C minus level card. It's going to be pretty decent or maybe a D plus depending on uh, how many archetypes have expensive cards. Next is Draugr Thought Thief. This is a really neat design as well. You can look at either your deck or your opponent's deck, which is kind of neat. And uh, then you essentially get to scry for them. I think it's just going to be like a, a C minus level card. It's a three mana three two that scries you one, which is just a reasonable card, but nothing too special. And being able to target your opponent can be pretty helpful uh, in a top deck war or something like that, where you just need them not to draw something for one turn while you finish them off. But generally, I feel like you're going to target yourself because putting a card into your own graveyard could be beneficial for some reasons, and uh, you generally will have more control. And uh, if you don't know what your opponent is it's in your opponent's hand, it's less easy to know. Like, do they want this land? Do they not want this land? things of that nature. So you're probably going to target yourself most of the time with this card as just a heads up. It's very tempting to just be like, oh, I can target my opponent. I'm going to do that. But strategically, it's probably best to target yourself in most cases. Next up is Frost Augur. This is a really cool design as well. I think it's probably going to play out like a C plus. Just the ability to uh, have a cheap creature that gets you some advantage is nice. If, if it's going to be a C plus and uh, if you have a lot of snow permanence. So it's more of like a build around grade. This is like one of those asterisk ones. Uh, because if you don't have snow permanent, it's not great. But if like half of your deck or a little bit under half of your deck is snow due to you having a lot of snow creatures and snow lands and snow enchantments and things like that, then it can actually be quite good. Uh, one of the cards that it reminds me of a little bit is Dryad Greenseeker, which was a two mana one three that tapped and if it revealed a land, you could draw the land. And so that's obviously cost a little bit of extra mana up front, but then it's free to use and lands are going to be like half of your deck almost. So it's like a decent amount better than frost auger but that card was so good that frost auger looked like it has potential to me and if your deck has like 17 snow cards in it like because you've been really prioritizing the lands then you're going to be willing to pay that cost you're going to make sure you need to make sure you have the ability to activate this consistently by having snow lands and you have a lot of snow cards to like draw them but definitely can be a pretty good card and if it can, it's probably going to in, a, in like a medium snow deck it'll probably be like a c plus it could be better than that in a really good snow deck and it's going to be like unplayable in some decks so you'll probably know when you're drafting how good it'll be um, and if you take it early, you're going to want to build around it, though. You probably don't want to take it too early if you're uh, if there's something else that's good in the pack because uh, it's a pretty risky card. Next is Frost Peak Yeti. This is just going to be a classic D-plus level card. Um, maybe a C-minus if you really care about having snow creatures in play, but a 4-mana 3-3 that can sometimes come through unblockable is just like Toe Manima from Corsa 2021, uh, and it's, uh, yeah, a 4-mana 3-3 that can't be blocked is... Uh, pretty typical for blue and it's going to be like a d plus because it's just not great stats for its cost so being snow can help it out so if you have snow synergies um it gets a little bit of a boost next is frostpire arcanist i think this is going to be like a c plus level card it is a giant for those synergies if it costs four mana consistently it's going to be really good uh and it does get a lot better the more copies of any individual instant or sorcery you have is because if it's like consistently like a five mana two five that draws you your best removal spell you're going to be pretty happy playing that sort of card and if it costs four mana a decent amount of the time then you're going to be even happier so it's like a c plus if you have the ability to trigger it consistently like if you have three copies of a card uh or you have a couple of doubles or things like that it'll get a little bit better it might incentivize you to play some um multiples of a card that you might not typically play but i think it's going to be like a c plus if you can trigger it uh, and it can go up if you have a lot, like a really good spell that you can get more copies of. Like the quality of the spell you're getting will have a pretty big impact on this card's grade. Next is Giant's Amulet. This is probably just going to be a C. It's essentially like a five mana, four or five hexproof. As long that can't that that does let loses hexproof if it, if it attacks, which is going to be pretty decent. Uh, you can put this onto your bomb rare that maybe has a static ability, uh, and just making a four four. You're never really going to want to cast this for just one mana. 
the ability to just make the four like a four or five creature is going to be a pretty big brick wall against a lot of decks and if you ever put this on a vigilance creature it's going to be pretty nice as well uh, i think some of the angels maybe have vigilance so that could be a nice little synergy to look for uh, because if you have a vigilance creature it never becomes tapped uh, so you'll be able to attack with it all the live long day but this is a pretty cool card i think it's going to be like playing out like a c or a c plus if you have vigilance if you're more aggressive it gets worse because you don't really care about the hexproof part then because it i mean you do care about it but you're not going to be able to attack and keep the hexproof so it gets worse then but if you're a controlling deck it's going to be pretty nice for having a big blocker that they can't uh punch through so probably going to be like a c plus in more controlling decks and a little bit worse in aggro decks but still a pretty cool design i think it's going to overall play out like a c a lot of the time next is glimpse the cosmos also it gets better if you have giant synergies speaking of which we have glimpse the cosmos i think this is also going to be like a c but you have to have giants in your deck for it to be a c and otherwise it's going to be like a d so if you're have the ability to um look at the top like the, the just casting the spell isn't great it's like a sorcery speed anticipate which is medium uh but if you ever can cast it like get it back like if you have three or four giants in your deck so you'll eventually be able to ca cast it again for one mana it's going to be really nice so in those cases it'll be a, like a c sometimes a c plus depending on your number of giants uh they're generally going to trend towards a c and then if you only have no giant if you have no giants glimpse the cosmos is going to be like a d level card Next is Ice Bind Pillar. This card is really, really good, uh, but you do have to have enough snow lands to make it work. So if you have like five or six snow lands, this card is easily going to be like a B plus level card, um, because or, or B or a B plus level card because you're going to be able to use it consistently. But if you don't aren't going to be able to use it consistently, you can't play it. So I, I gave the card a B B grade in my evaluation just because it does require you to have snow lands but if you have snow lands just being able to tap things is really nice and sneaky powerful uh there's going to be a lot of comparisons between this card and icy manipulator which is a really good card uh, but one of the reasons icy manipulator is so good is because if you take it early in the draft you know it's going to be an all-star in your deck because it's colorless to cast and colorless to activate whereas this is not colorless to cast it is uh a blue card and it's not like a guarantee that you'll be able to activate it so for those reasons even though it does cost a little bit less than icy manipulator it's a decent amount worse just because it's not as flexible because it's more narrow in the decks it can go in so i think ice bind pillar is probably going to play out like a b because icy manipulator is still a great card even if it is in blue and a little bit narrower to use uh, and the cost reduction does help in that regard too so i think it's going to play out like a b a very good card be on the lookout for snowlands if you have this one Next is Inga Runeyes. I gave this one a C plus, but that's because I'm a little bit ambitious on its build around potential. Uh, if it's not going to be built around, it's probably going to be like a C because it's just a four mana three three that scries three, which is a reasonable card on its own. But if you have a card like Village Rites, which we'll, we'll get to later, that lets you sack a creature or instant speed removal spells, then the way you can do this is you trade off your Inga Runeyes with another creature, and uh, before they die, like the before the block resolves, you. Um, you kill a creature with your instant speed removal spell or you sacrifice your own creature with an instant speed removal spell uh, or something yeah or things of that nature and then you have three creatures dying and you draw three cards if you're drawing three cards from this in some percentage of games it becomes like a c plus or sometimes even a little bit better if you can consistently trigger it but if it's just a four mana three three scry three it'll probably just be a uh, c level card it reminds me a lot of Octo Profit from Course at 2020 in that way, but I think it's going to be pretty reasonable, and it's not that difficult to trigger if you have some instant speed removal. Uh, it's definitely possible. You just have to like trade this off. So probably going to play out like a C plus because when you do draw three in like the 10% or 20% of games where that happens, you're going to be way way ahead. Next is Carfell Harbinger. I'm actually really excited to play with this card. It looks really sweet. It's a uh, like man blue doesn't often get a mana ramp uh, type thing and uh since there are a lot of foretell cards you're going to be able to use this for mana pretty consistently so i think this is going to play out like a c plus uh two mana one three that taps for mana is pretty nice usually it's like a little bit more narrow in what it can tap for um and like it might only be able to tap for foretell or things like that but it can cast a reasonable subset of your spells which is going to make it a pretty decent addition to your deck there are also some things that minorly care about wizards like the five mana two five that we looked at earlier i think cares about having wizards or giants in play i'm not a hundred percent on whether that's true let's just double check yeah if you have control a giant or a wizard and it is a wizard so inga's a wizard carfell's a uh, harbinger's a wizard so that's a relevant thing to keep in mind is that it can sometimes make your other cards a little bit better in that regard as well next up is lit yara kin seekers so this one's going to be pretty tough to use i think it's just very clunky i think it's going to end up being like a c minus or d plus depending on how many of a certain type you have because if it's a four mana three five some number of the games that 
like scry's one that's a really good card but a four mana two four is a really bad card so i think it's probably going to end up playing like a d plus but in certain decks you're going to be able to get it more consistently like it might be the sort of card that only works in like a dedicated shapeshifters deck or a dedicated giants deck slash uh like wizards deck like giant wizard slash type deck because you might just not be able to trigger your lit lit yara kin seekers very easily and if you can't trigger it it's not a very good card though the downside is not like unplayable so it's still just gonna be like a d plus um but if, if you can never trigger it, it's gonna be like a card you never want to put in your deck but if you can sometimes trigger it it gets like a d plus and gets a little bit better from there next is mists of lidyara so we're on the little yara binge here <laughs> because this was K Lydiara Kinseeker so we're traveling through Lydiara and uh, I think this card's not going to be great a two mana uh, removal spell that only gives minus three minus zero oh is just a little bit weak one of the problems is it, it, it's like it's not a great tool for an aggressive deck because if your opponent if you can't like use it to get rid of a blocker and that's just a major downside because if your opponent ha plays like a three four or play play a 4-4 four, four, and you have a miss of Lyara, you're not going to be able to attack into their creature and the fact that it just sticks around is really a big deal uh on in a more defensive deck it, it's a little bit better because you don't really care as much and you can win with a flyer or something like that but um it reminds me of slime bind from ravnica allegiance and that card was like medium but you really needed to have like flyers to be able to attack past their ground creatures and sometimes your opponent's going to play like a 5-5 five, five, and a 2-5 is still like a relevant body so miss of Lyara, i think is going to be like a d plus level card or maybe a C minus, depending on your aggression level. Next is Mistwalker. I like this card a lot. Uh, it being a changeling is going to be pretty relevant. A three mana one four flyer is like fairly typical stats, and the ability to attack for a little bit more if you pump some mana into it is nice. Uh, I think generally what's going to be good about this card is it being a changeling because it can fuel some of your tribal synergies, and being a flyer is kind of nice, and it's a decent blocker. And for all those reasons, I think the card is just a C. Um, I think changelings are going to be pretty nice for enabling your giant synergies because sorry about that um being a uh like there are a lot of cards that care about having giants or there are a reasonable number and but and yet a lot of the giants are more expensive so having like a three mana changeling that's a reasonable card to trigger your giants cards is going to be quite nice so for that reason i think it's going to be a c uh and the ability to sometimes attack them for like four damage in the mid game i mean if you have eight mana or i mean if you have six mana you'll be able to attack them for four with your guy which is a reasonable clock so probably gonna be a c level card Next up is Pilfering Hawk. Again, probably going to be a C if you can enable the snow, just because uh, it, it's just like uh, Seeker of Truth. Um, it's like the card in Ikoria that was just a 2-mana 1-2 that could tap to loot, and this is a decent amount better than that because it's a snow creature, so it'll fuel your other snow permanents, and it's a flyer, which is nice for chipping in for damage. Uh, so if you, have other, some, if you have some snow lands to activate it, you don't need that many because you're generally not going to be activating this until the mid-game or late game where you're going to be trying to ditch your lands uh, sometimes it's nice to activate early if you need to find lands but generally you're going to be pretty happy if you are uh, casting your two mana one two fueling your other snow cards and then looting away cards late so i think it's gonna be like a c level card it's a really good design I, lo I love a lot of the designs in this set and the artwork is just gorgeous knocked it out of the park dan scott really i mean there's a lot of gorgeous artwork but i'm just really struck by this one it just looks incredible really Next is Raven Form. This one's getting a lot of buzz, I've been told. Uh, and I think it's probably going to be a D plus level card. Um, it's just the problem with Raven Form is that a 1 1 flyer is too often going to be a relevant body in a game of limited. If it was a 0 1 flyer, then it would be like quite good, I think. But the fact is that a 1 1 is often going to be able to like contribute on double blocks, chip in for damage on your life total, and in other ways be like a relevant creature. And sometimes your removal spells have to go at like medium sized creatures. So like if your opponent plays a three, three with a good ability, you're going to have to kill that. And all of a sudden you've only like shrunk the creature slightly and you've spent a whole card on this. Now there are some foretell synergies with make this a little bit better. And I don't think the cards unplayable. I still think it's like a D plus, like you'll be okay playing a copy in your deck, but you don't want to go ham on, <laughs> go ham on. I just love that saying, but you don't want to go overboard on your Raven forms uh, because it just, not going to be giving you the effect you want a lot of the time it actually reminds me of this card casmina's transmutation from war of the spark which was like a two mana aura that made a creature into a one one with no abilities and that card was ended up being pretty bad like quite poor and you didn't really want to put it in your deck and this is like giving them a one one flyer and it costs more so um given that that card was bad it's not always like a one for one if one card's bad there can still be a card that's worse and better in the context of the format uh, exiling is definitely relevant sometimes, but I just think the card's going to be pretty 
deeply mediocre, like probably a D plus level card, and uh, you don't want too many copies of it. Next is Run Ashore. This card's another D plus, or maybe even just a D. I, I think it's just a D level card. Uh, it's just too expensive for what it does. Um, it is nice that you can bounce your own permanents, so you can like put one of their permanents on top of their library or bottom of the library. Um, and uh, yeah, so putting you basically can. Oh, I actually didn't realize you could put stuff on the bottom of their library when I gave it that grade. That's actually potentially changes it up to a D plus or a C minus. It is still expensive, but being able to put a non land permanent on the bottom. Oh no, they get to choose. Yeah, I'm back. <laughs> I'm back where I started, chat. It, 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 I don't know why I said chat. This is YouTube, but yeah, sorry about that. I, I, I read the card and then I read it just now and I thought that I had read it incorrectly before, but no. So they get to choose whether it goes on top or bottom, which is pretty important. And uh, it's just very clunky. So I think it's gonna be like a D, even though you can bounce your own creatures with one half and bounce their creature with the other. Uh, and it's not technically card disadvantage because putting it on top of their deck is not uh, card disadvantage. It can be a pretty nice mana swing as well. You can bounce two of their things, put one on top. Uh, but it's probably just going to be like a D or D plus because it is so expensive. The artwork is pretty <laughs> hilarious. The bow's just getting tossed onto the uh, shore, which I guess isn't hilarious, but you know, it's it's a nice little picture for a card called Run Ashore. <laughs> Next is Rune of Flight. This card's just going to be a C, I think. Uh, giving a creature flying for two mana and replacing itself is just pretty reasonable. It doesn't buff the stats at all. Uh, if you can, if you and you ha do have some equipments in your deck, putting this on equipments is really nice because being able to like give any anything flying that you want is nice, but overall this is going to be a C or a C plus if you really want a way to get a flyer into the air. Uh, but a lot of the time it's going to be, uh, flying is one of the best abilities to give, which is why this is pretty nice, but it's a little bit marginal upside. Uh, it does like do nothing to affect the board. You do need to have some setup, like you have to have a creature in play and things of that nature. So, and you can get blown up by removal. So I think it's probably going to end up being a C or a C plus, but most likely a C. Next is Saw It Coming. This is the type of spell that looks like that normally, if it was just a three mana counter spell, would be like a C minus or a D plus. But because of the format context with Foretell, I think it's going to end up being a C or a C plus in a heavy Foretell deck. Um, because if you for if you have this card in your deck and you cast this against your opponent, all of a sudden, every time you Foretell a card, they have to be worried about whether or not it's your counter spell. And so you can have multiple cards face down and you can have your, then you can start holding up like three things at once. You can hold up your counter spell. You can hold up your draw spell and then you can hold up your like one mana deal five to an, a, a tap creature. And all of a sudden your opponent is just left in a pickle with not knowing what to do. So I think it's going to be like a C, but it does get better in dedicated foretell decks. If those end up being a thing for the foretell cards generally seem pretty good. So I'm not sure how many of the like foretell cards you're going to be able to get, but I'm generally uh, going to be uh, pretty happy rating this as a C. Next up is Strategic Planning, just a pretty typical deep level card. It uh, gives you some card selection. It gets a little bit better if you have cards that care about things in the graveyard. Like there is a cycle of creatures, I think, maybe one for each color that cares about uh, exiling a creature from your own graveyard. So if you have stuff like that, it gets a little bit better to have Strategic Planning because all of a sudden you're starting to trigger your creatures. But generally it's going to be like a D level card. Next is Undersea Invader. This is also just going to be a D. Um, if you need a big creature, you can play it, but it coming in tapped means it's never going to be able to ambush things, which is one of the big upsides of a card like uh, that's a big flash creature. So if you're in a deck where you want to be holding up mana to do a variety of things, I guess Undersea Invader has a home there, but it's still just a little bit too expensive for uh, a card that comes in. Like, it's a six mana five six is a little bit understated. Uh, giving it flash doesn't do much when it comes in tapped. So it's just going to be a D. Okie doke. Deep breath. Moving on to the black cards. We start off with Bloodski. <laughs> it's not actually Bloodski, but it, it, that would be a really funny name. Blood Sky Berserker. Uh, and I think this card's going to be a C plus, just a little bit above average because a two mana one one that can just become a three three fairly easily. Um, you have to recognize. It's important to recognize that if you like draw this in the mid game, it's going to be hard to consistently trigger it because by that point you're going to have probably used your double spells to trigger your other cards that care about it but it's got some nice upside in the early game uh, because if you start attacking them with a two mana three three and then you've really built your deck and you can start attacking them with a two mana five five early in the game uh, it's going to be pretty difficult to deal with so i think it gets a nice little c plus a grade it's also just a nice little two drop so you can use it to double spell with other things so you can like cast this and then cast a second spell on the same turn in the mid game maybe Next is Death Nail Berserker. I gave this a C minus. A two mana two two is all, is generally just like a C minus base because you don't need that much to make it um, 
be able to put it in your deck and be decently happy with it. And there are some cards that are going to buff this power if you like put an equipment on it or something. If it dies into a 2-2, that's actually really good. Especially if you were using an equipment to make it bigger, because in that case, you can then just put the equipment on the 2-2 and have another like decent-sized creature. So I think it's going to be a C-, and it gets better if you have more ways to make it big. Um, also, if you like use a uh, like combat trick to help it trade off or something like that, then you get a 2-2 back, which is a little bit of nice upside if you're 2 for one yourself with a combat trick. Next is Demonic Gifts. It's a pretty good card with the Death Nail Berserker um, because the creature dies and returns the battlefield under your control and it buffs the power. So you would get that nice little 2 2 zombie. Uh, but, and you'll even get the Death Nail Berserker back. But it is a little bit expensive, uh, clunky, so I gave this a D, plus, even though um, it's like a reasonable combat trick to put in your deck. And it protects from removal as well. Next is Dogged Pursuit. I gave this card an F. It's just doesn't do anything one of the ways you can think about this is like a four mana one one lifelink unblockable shroud creature so you can't interact with it your opponent can't interact with it it just chips in for one every turn and spending four mana for that effect is not good uh people compare this to ill-gotten inheritance which is a card that i also wasn't a fan of and i can i can readily i think everybody can readily see that ill-gotten inheritance was far better not only for the format context where things like spectacle mattered but also because having a six mana activated ability to deal four to your opponent and gain four is just a huge upside on a card like this overall dogged pursuits an f you shouldn't be playing it if your opponent plays it you should breathe a sigh of relief that they didn't play a real card like it can it'll sometimes like do some annoying things but just compared to other four mana cards you could play it's just really bad and not a card you should ever be putting in your deck next up is draugr recruiter uh which is going to be a pretty decent card i think it's going to be a c minus just because it's a little bit expensive to use but when you think about um it being like a kicker card like if you imagine it was like eight mana for a three three they returned a creature from your graveyard to your hand you're like well that's not very good but then when you think oh if it was a four mana three three with kicker for four where you could all of a sudden do that it is a little bit better and this is i think even a little bit better than that because if you say three play a three drop and it trades off then on turn four, you play Draugr Recruiter, and then on turn five, you attack and pay your four, and then Draugr Recruiter trades off. Then all of a sudden, you've gotten the value, and you um, like were able to um, use your mana pretty effectively. So I think it's going to be a C-. minus. It's pretty clunky, which is my reasoning for that. But, and it, but I think if, if it lines up properly with the format, maybe it ends up being a C. But right now, I'm going to start with C-. minus. The difference between a C- minus and a C is not that extreme. The minuses and pluses are just like small indicators that are kind of neat to use give a little bit more distinction but it's just going to be a pretty reasonable card to put in your deck i think it's pretty sweet design as well but yeah probably a c minus next is draugr's helm uh, i think this is going to be a c it's really expensive to equip which means that oftentimes you're not going to be able to um, but a five mana four four menace that then dies into an equipment that even if it's expensive is still pretty relevant is going to be pretty reasonable so i think it's going to be a c maybe a c plus if you really care about equipments or zombies or something Next is Dread Rider. This is a pretty typical D level card. It is a pretty big like stat line. Three seven is hard to attack through, uh, but it's not as easy as it would sound to get a creature card into your grave. Get like consistent creatures into your graveyard. Like you maybe you'll have a, a couple, um, but sometimes you just won't have any, which is kind of a weird like quirk of magic. Is sometimes you just don't have a lot of creatures in your graveyard, especially if you have other cards that are caring about exiling them or returning them into your hand or things like that. But a six mana three seven that can then like make them slowly lose life is is decent and you'll play it as a finisher. But for a six mana card to be a, like a premium card that you're looking to draft early or take in the middle of a pack and be happy with, it has to do like something pretty special. And Dread Rider doesn't really do that. I think it's probably a D or a D plus level card. Like you're not like unhappy if you play it, but it's not like a card that you really need to prioritize ever. Next is Dusk Wielder, another D level card. Um, I wanted to give this almost an F. But there are some situations where you might care about using boast, and it is pretty cheap to boast. It's probably more like a D minus or F, because I don't really think there's a lot of situations where you're going to want to be playing this card, um, because it's just so small. You know what? I will just. I, I don't want to just say it's unplayable, because I think there might be decks that care about triggering boast, or if you have a card that triggers boast, then maybe it is no longer unplayable. But for starters, we can just call Dusk Wielder an F. I have revised my opinion from when I was preparing this pres from, was preparing this set review, <laughs> where I was like, ah, maybe there's a spot where you want this card. Um, my, I think there is some thought like, oh, if you're a deck that cares about casting two spells in a turn, or you're a deck that cares about boast, maybe it's marginally playable. But in general, it's going to be just horrible jank. So we'll give 
give it a D minus. We'll give it a little bit of an upgrade from F, but I think it's generally going to be quite, quite poor. And I don't think personally that I'll ever play it. Um, unless there's like some really crazy rare that cares about boasting. So maybe it's just an F level card. A lot of discussion for such a terrible card. <laughs> Next is Elder Fang Disciple. I think this card's gonna end up being a C minus. So it a lot of people love this type of effect. It feels really nice to like be like, oh I got a two for one with my two drop. But the thing is is a one one. If it doesn't actually trade with your opponent's creatures, it's not gonna actually be like a two for one because you essentially spent two mana to make them discard and then get the marginal upside of a one one. So it's like not the greatest because you're spending mana to do it. But uh, if you have ways to sacrifice this, or your opponent has some X1s, or the format has a lot more X1s than maybe it would normally be, there are a couple. There's like a good red X1, there's a good white X1 that I've noticed. Um, then the card maybe just becomes a C level card. But uh, I'm starting off with C minus and then bumping it up depending on whether I have ways to use the little 1 1 creature to my advantage, like sacrifice outlets or things like that. And it does actually become a pretty decent card if you have sack outlets because it's a pretty free thing to sacrifice. Next is Feed the Serpent. Uh, what is my front runner for best black common um, and uh, just pretty nice I think it's probably going to be a B minus exiling a creature for four mana is a little bit expensive but it's just unconditional removal and those are the sorts of things you need to have in limited so pretty nice card and one you're going to be happy taking early and playing often being double black does mean that you're not going to be able to splash it but it's still going to be a great card next up Grim Draugr. I like the word Draugr. It's kind of fun to say. Uh, I think this is going to be C minus. Uh, three mana, three, two that has an activated ability is reasonable. It being snow could be relevant. It being a zombie is maybe sometimes relevant uh, for like one of the build around uncommon, one of the uncommons that we'll see later. At least it may be some rares. Uh, but uh, three mana, three, two needs a little bit of help to be a decent card and having the extra activated ability can be relevant. So, but if you can't activate it, it's a D plus. And if you can't activate it, it's like a C minus and you can activate it multiple times. So you can sometimes like use it a few times in a turn if you have enough snow lands. Next is Hailstorm Valkyrie. I gave this card a C minus because having a lot of snow lands is going to be tricky and it's kind of expensive to activate uh, a four mana, a two, two flyer is just too small. Uh, and then if you have to spend two mana to activate it, then it's just a little bit um, too clunky. It's also like not a guarantee that you're going to have a lot of snow lands. So I think it's probably going to end up being like a C plus, a C minus or a D plus level card just because it's pretty terrible on defense. If you don't, if like you tap out for this, it's just a two, two, your opponent just kills it with like a small removal spell or something. And then even when you're attacking, it doesn't attack for very much. So I'm probably going to give this a D plus and then it goes up to a C minus if you have enough snow lands to activate it like twice in a turn. Because then it gets like, like if all your lands are snow lands, then you can like use this to hit your opponent for like six in a turn sometimes, which is pretty nice. But even that's still not great because it's such a small creature to start with. So probably a D plus in most decks and a C minus in others uh, if you really care about the snow part. Next is Infernal Pet. I'm actually really excited to play with this card, even though it seems to be eating a butterfly. I just noticed that. That's horrifying. Gosh, the cruelties of war. Infernal Pet, yikes. But I think this is going to be like a C plus level card. Uh, a three mana two two that can become a flyer and uh, get the counter permanently is quite nice. So a three mana three three flyer would be really good. And this is oftentimes going to be able to play out like that if you build your deck properly. And it can even get bigger from there. So I think it's going to actually be a pretty nice card and I'm pretty excited to play with it. Um, so yeah, I, I, I hope it plays out like a C plus because I think it'll be a really fun card to play with if it ends up being good. My gosh, the flavor text is dark. That is brutal. I I just saw the flavor text here and it just fully sank in what it's saying. Gosh, I never read the flavor text before, but geez Louise, maybe we don't want to incentivize this sort of card in our decks. That's a bit of, a, bit of a negative vibe there. Next up is Jarl the Forsaken. I think this is also going to be a C plus. It actually really does benefit from Fortel because with this sort of card, sometimes your opponent will make an attack and you're like, well, they're suiciding their creature and the only card they could have is Jarl of the Forsaken. But if they have just a Fortel card face down, you're like, well, maybe they have Jarl of the Forsaken or maybe they have something else. They only have two mana up, so they'd have to have exactly that to punish me or something like that. And uh, or you can use it on their turn. You're like they're like attacking in, and you just jump block and then flash in Jarl. So I think it's gonna be like a C plus or uh, level card uh, because it, it, if your opponent's really good and plays around it, it gets a little bit worse. But if your opponent uh, doesn't know it's coming or they can't afford to play around it, it just like gets a lot of work done unless you use your small creatures and leverage those. So it's just gonna be a C plus level card a lot of the time. 
Next is Carfil Kennel Master. Really sweet design. I love some of the designs in this set, and this is one of my one of the ones that I like a lot. Um, a five mana four four needs a little bit of help, but giving two creatures indestructible and plus one plus zero uh, lets them attack a lot of the time. So if you have like a couple three twos, all of a sudden they're attacking for like eight, which is just massive. So I think this is going to end up being like a C level card. You can't afford to put too many five drops in your deck, but if you set up the board for this and then hit them for like eight, it's just going to be really tough for a lot of decks to deal with. Like. Even just with two, three twos, it's really good. And if you have some lifelink creature, you can gain some life and things like that. Um, it's just really going to change the texture of the board a lot of the time. So it is expensive, but it's going to be a really solid top end card. Next is Coma's Faithful. I give this a D plus. There are enough ways to punish X ones that this isn't going to be great. Uh, each player milling three cards could be relevant if you have some stuff that cares about exiling creatures from your graveyard. But generally, I'm not going to be... Uh, super thrilled to put this in my deck when there's a decent number of 1-1s and 1-1 flyers running around or 1-1 uh, or just yeah I think it's generally going to be trading off with a 2-drop or a token which isn't great so it's probably a D plus next is poison the cup this card is fantastic it's going to be like a B level card um, it's like murder but it can scry to if you foretell it which is just really nice um, so just a great removal spell probably just gonna be a b maybe even a b plus depending on uh how things end up working out if you end up foretelling it a lot of the time but i feel like you're just gonna often cast this as a murder which is gonna be like a b level card so yeah, just a nice rock solid b there really good card next is priest of the haunted edge this has some really trippy artwork but it's gonna end up being a d um most decks aren't going to have enough snow lands to really consistently use this to kill something big. Uh, some decks are going to have a lot of snow stuff, and so in those decks it gets a little bit of a boost, like a nice build around boost. But even then, if you have like three, if you have say five snow lands in your deck, or um, like like if you have like five or six snow lands in your deck, then maybe in the mid game you're going to be able to give something minus two, minus two, or something. So it's still not great. So I think it's going to be like a D. And uh, in most decks, it's going to be like an F. And in some decks, it'll be like a D plus. <laughs> so uh, really variable depending on how many snow lands you have. But a lot of it, the time, it's going to be a pretty uh, mediocre card or just straight up awful unplayable card. Next is Raise the Dragger. This is going to probably be a C. The fact that there are changelings in the set makes this a lot better because it increases your odds of being able to bring back two cards. Um, if you have a lot of zombies or things like that, then it could be nice as well. But you really need to consistently be bringing back two cards. Uh, if you can only bring back one card most of the time with this, then it's going to be like a D. But I feel like there's going to be enough overlap in the creatures or tribal synergies or changeling stuff that you can bring back two cards. So probably actually going to be more like a C minus um, or D plus level card when you, uh, in terms of prioritizing it, because it's going to be hard to use sometimes. So probably just a C minus or D plus. Eh, let's just make a final decision. It'll be a C minus because it is a nice effect in the mid game and having one copy of this in your deck is going to be nice and you'll just have to have a couple changelings or a couple of zombies or something in your deck but and then if you don't have multiples of the same type then it just becomes like a d or yeah if you don't have any multiples of the same type it can, becomes like unplayable almost but i'm assuming most decks are going to be able to trigger this most of the time or at least some of the time so yeah probably going to be a uh, d plus in most decks and a c plus c minus if you do some work Man, I don't know why that card was so hard for me to wrap my head around. C plus, C minus versus D plus is just like a kind of arbitrary grade, which is like, are you happy to have that card in your deck? And I feel like a lot of black decks are going to be happy to have one copy of that card, which makes it like a C minus in my mind. Whereas a D plus is a card you're like, oh, I can put this in my deck, but I'm never going to be like looking for one. Okay, next is Return Upon the Tide. This is also going to be like a C minus card. I feel like you're oftentimes going to want to foretell this um, because spending five mana in a turn isn't as good necessarily. Uh, and you can maybe just uh, spread it out because it isn't a card you want to cast into the late game. But returning a card and getting two elves is nice. Uh, so if you have some elves that you might want to get back, then it's like a card that you're looking for. And if you don't have elves to get back, then it's a D plus. And if you do have elves, it's a C minus because getting those extra two one ones is really nice. Next is Rune of Mortality. I think this is a C plus level card. It's actually really nice because there are some cards that care more about dealing one damage than other than about death such than others um there's a car card in red that we'll get to that has a boast ability to ping something and that's like this card's best friend because if the card has death touch then all of a sudden you're pinging and uh killing their creatures with the one damage it's also nice to put on an equipment because making your equipment give death touch makes all of your creatures incredible blockers which is really hard to deal with so i think this is going to be a little bit better than some of the other runes and i'll probably end up giving it a c plus because of the nice little combos you can get with this card 
Maybe that means that the Rune of Flying should be a C plus as well, because Flying is also a good ability. But I just see a lot of potential with this, and especially putting it on equipment for defensive purposes. And just generally giving your little creatures Death Touch is nice. Next is Skemfar Shadow Sage. This is just going to be a, a C minus level card. Um, it'll do a couple damage, it'll or it'll gain you a couple of life. But a four mana two five is still just like a reasonable body regardless of that and the lowest it's going to do is gain you one or deal one so the flexibility combined with the stat line makes this like a c minus in my mind and i can imagine some decks where it's like really good where you have a lot of changelings or a lot of elves or something and you just like blow them out of the water which would be pretty cool so a c minus but it can get a lot better if you have a ton of elves or something next is skull raid i'm also going to give this a c minus it is a little bit expensive to use but the fact that you're always going to get two cards out of the deal is really nice and this artwork is like really it even reminds me of van gogh because the guy in the picture kind of looks like van gogh but it's just kind of really trippy art uh, but yeah it's a pretty reasonable c minus level card and a lot of the time you're going to foretell this one uh, to split up the cost and try to cast it to knock out your opponent's last two cards or to um draw a couple cards yourself the fact that this is in the set means that holding a couple of extra lands in your hand could be nice to prevent your opponent from drawing two cards in the mid game if they might have this card because i feel like it's going to be played pretty decently and so yeah as it is a like c minus level card one that you're pretty reasonably happy to play next is turgrid's shadow i gave this card a c because you know it's coming but your opponent doesn't so especially if you use the foretell on it then maybe you can wait until uh after a combat where you have blocked two of their creatures and then you cast this and kill two of their other creatures now that you have no creatures uh, it gets better if you can play build with it and play with it and so i think it's going to be like a c level card uh, because it is going to be really bad against tokens and stuff but it's going to be really good against other matchups so it's a pretty swingy card but i think overall it's going to be a c because you can build the board state in such a way that it'll work out for you a lot of the time and then sideboard it out if it's bad in the matchup Next is a Vengeful Reaper. I also gave this card a C. It's got a lot of abilities, but a lot of them are kind of a hodgepodge here. So it has Foretell. It also has Haste and Death Touch, which isn't the greatest combo. Death Touch is generally good on cheap creatures that are small and are going to block because it's not like great on attackers. But it's like it's a flying Haste creature, so it has that going for it. But it's like a 4-mana 2-3 flyer, which is not great. So, But it does block well, which makes the Haste not very good. So I think it's going to be a C, but maybe it'll be... A little bit better if you care about angels or something uh, or if you care about ortho foretell ends up working out in its favor but i feel like it's just too clunky like it a four mana two three flyer wouldn't be great giving a death touch makes it a good blocker but you would rather have death touch on something smaller not like that you can like choose oh i can take my death touch from my vengeful reaper and give it to my one one but um uh, generally it's just the haste is also a little bit weird on a small powered creature like that it's probably going to be a C. Maybe it's a C plus if you really if the abilities really line up well or something. But it's just such a weird card. I think it's probably going to be a C level card. Moving on to village rights, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but having this as an available sacrifice tool is nice. You can hold this up if your opponent goes for removal. All of a sudden, you sack the creature, and essentially you don't have to like pay the cost of just drawing two cards because they were going to kill the creature anyway. There is a way to steal your opponent's creatures in red, so you can steal their creature and then sack it to village rights, which is a reasonable combo. So sacrifice outlets are nice for that purpose. Um, and overall, just a pretty reasonable card. It's like a C. Um, you can generally find a creature to sacrifice. You can also sack creatures that they put auras on, those sorts of things. Um, and uh, that's even better if you have like Rise of the Draugr, the card that can get things back from the graveyard. Because if they put an ore on your creature, you can then sacrifice it so you can get it back from the graveyard. So I think it's going to be end up being a C. And maybe the last black card? I have no idea. I just keep going like, man, is this the last black card? But yeah, uh, I have done my preparation. I've looked at all these cards and done some preliminary grading. But yeah, Way Down I think might be one of the better black commons. Um, I think it's going to be like a C plus level card. Uh, one mana for a minus three, minus three is nice. It does require you to have a decent number of creatures that are small so you can trade off in the early game and then use this in the mid game uh, because in like top decking this oftentimes minus three minus three kills relevant creatures even in the mid game because there's like a four three or a three three flyer or things like that. So I think way down is just going to kill a lot of the stuff you care about and uh, if you have some two twos or things like that then uh, you're going to be uh, like in the early game two and two twos you can trade them off and then use way down to take out your punish creature so probably a pretty decent black common probably i gave it a c plus next up is wither crown the gift that keeps on giving black cards that are in the v's and w's just so many i think wither crown's a c minus it looks pretty clunky but your opponent can't keep the creature around forever 
um, even if it's a zero power creature, there are still more like if, if, it's mostly good in a defensive deck because if your opponent uh, has like a, a three three, playing Wither Crown on it isn't very good because it'll still blank your attack for two every turn or whatever you're attacking for, and so the one life isn't a huge cost because they're still saving damage. But if you're a defensive deck, uh, Wither Crown makes their deck uh, creature unable to attack you unless it has like a counter on it, uh, which makes it like a decent defensive tool. So if you're a defensive deck, it's like a card that you're relatively happy to play. It's not great in an aggressive deck a lot of the time, even though the losing of a life is relevant in aggressive decks. The blocker will oftentimes save them more damage, which makes it a little bit weaker. So I think until and then they can sacrifice it once they've got other creatures to stabilize. So I don't think Wither Crown is all that good. Um probably like a c minus but because it still does deal with things but it's not really great as good an aggressive dex as it might look um and they can also just sacrifice the creature if they really care about the life and you're an aggressive deck but yeah it's a really weird design and if you're a more defensive deck it's going to be pretty decent for taking out their attackers and things like that it does let them sacrifice the creature for value if they have a sack outlet or things like that but yeah pretty interesting that it's also weird because if they have equipment they can like put the equipment on the creature and all of a sudden they're just paying one life but they still have the equi the creature so yeah i think it's a c minus but in some decks uh, that are more defensive it'll be a card you're happy playing and then the more aggressive deck is still not great but i don't think it ever really gets better than a c minus okay we've moved on to the red cards starting off with axe guard cavalry just a pretty solid c it's a two mana two two that then has some utility making your other creatures haste if you play like a big creature so you can maybe get in for a couple points of bonus damage so nice little c card there next is basalt ravager probably going to be a c plus um on its base it's a four mana four two that deals one uh if you have some wizards or some giants in your blue red deck or maybe some zombies in your black red deck or something like that oftentimes it's going to be best to combine with types that the basalt ravager has so like wizards or things like that uh but if you're doing like three damage consistently it'll be like a b, a b level card in your deck like a flame tongue kavu but the downside of only doing one damage is real enough that i'm happy giving it like a c plus or a b minus in most decks because some limited decks just have like all sorts of random creature types that have nothing in common. If you have a, a couple changelings, it gets better. But I think it's like the type of card where it's a C plus baseline, and then it gets like better for every like three creatures you have that share a type. I feel like I'm being too mathematical with that, but it's like it gets better if depending on how focused your deck is on one creature type, and so it can go from like C plus to B, but it'll never be like, and maybe even B plus if you're, it'll never really be a B plus because there's always the good chance that you're not going to have any creatures in play but it'll go from like c plus to b depending on how many creatures of the type you have so it's a pretty nice card i like it a lot next is breakneck berserker just a pretty typical c minus um maybe a d plus if the um stat line doesn't line up well with the format which is hard to say before uh, actually playing with the cards but uh three two for three with haste is just an okay card and uh can contribute to beat down draws nicely a defensive deck doesn't really care about it but a lot of red decks are going to be aggressive most likely Next is Cinderheart Giant. I gave this card a D, but it is a reasonable card. The only reason I gave it a D is because it's a seven drop, which means that a lot of red decks aren't going to be interested. But if you're playing like a ramp deck or something like that, this is a totally fine place to put your mana because it'll take out one of your opponent's creatures when it dies, and it's a good blocker. And it's just the fact that it costs seven is so much because seven is a huge cost in limited. So it's going to be a D uh, card that you're not going to take for a lot of decks, but the decks that do want it, are maybe going to take it are maybe going to like be pretty happy when they play it so like just because a card is a d doesn't necessarily mean that it's a card that's bad per se it just means that it's a card you're not going to take very highly because no other deck really wants this card and most red decks aren't going to want this card so it's like in the deck that wants it like maybe the one specific red ramp deck i'm not sure how much that's going to be a thing maybe it becomes like a d a c minus or something but most red decks it's a d here craven hulk pretty fun design i i really love the flavor this is like one of my favorite flavor texts you can like see the giant hiding behind the rock and the goats just standing on the rock and it's just like abandoned at birth the giant was raised by goats ironically it grew up to be the most cautious member of the herd <laughs> which is just really funny i think it's going to be if you're an aggressive deck that cares about attacking it'll be like a c minus because even aggressive decks care about blocking sometimes especially the turn where your big creature comes down but if you're a defensive deck then this card's like a like d because or even worse because like it probably just gonna be a d at worst maybe because it can still double block with things but probably not going to be a playable card if you're a, a deck that really wants to block but as i said most red decks are going to care about attacking so it's probably going to be a c minus overall 
Next is Crush the Week. I actually gave this a C plus because the fact that it can be foretold is actually really relevant with this sort of effect uh, because the way it works is you foretell the card and then at a later date, shall we say turn five or so, you use Crush the Week for its foretell. So you pay one red mana, deal a bunch of damage to things, and then you can use the extra, the two damage to like use your like one mana deal to to finish something off or something of that nature. And... Uh, it's also just a really good tool for red control decks. If you're an aggressive deck, you're not going to want this as much because it'll kill all of your own creatures. So this is, I guess, predicated on the fact that you're more of a controlling red deck or that you're a uh, like Giants deck that's going to have big red creatures or things like that. But it can definitely mop up some tokens, and exiling can be relevant as well. Like against that 2-mana two 2-1 two in white that like dies into a 1-1, one one, that sort of thing. But I think it's going to be like a C+, plus, depending on the format context. Next is Demon Bolt, pretty classic B minus here, three mana deal four, and then it's got additional foretell synergy. Just a fantastic card. It's funny because I feel like I talk less about the cards that are good, but this card is quite good. It might even get up to be a B level card, depending on how the four damage interacts with the format. If, if four damage kills like everything, then this could easily be a B, but I'm gonna start off with B minus. Um, the distinction between B minus and B is, I guess, relatively large because, um, I don't know, Bs are like the pretty, it's, it, for, at least for me, it's it's like subsequently harder to get to each grade level. I don't know. Grades are kind of a weird thing. Like A's are really rare in limited, but there's a lot of C's. And then B, once you get into the B range, it's pretty like a d decent distinction between the pluses and minuses. I don't know. Hard to be so uh, super mathematical with a subjective grade like that. And that's on a letter scale. But yeah, this is like a B minus or even a B level card, depending on how many other things it kills. Uh, the fact that it won't kill like a 6-6 six, six in green or something, or it's 5-5. Five, five. There are some 5-5s five, running around, I think. It is, means it's not like, I think, going to be a B, but I think a B- is a pretty good place to start and foretells some extra nice synergy. So look at me go. I did end up talking for a long time about a red card that's very clearly good. Next up is Doom Scar Titan. I gave this a, a C+. I think you're going to foretell this a lot of the time, and a lot of the time it'll be like a massive swing because um, it does count itself. So it's like a... If you do use the foretell, then it's like a five mana five four that buffs all your creatures and can attack in right away, which is going to be a massive swing. So if you're an aggressive deck, it'll probably be a B minus, and if you're a more controlling deck, you're not. You're still going to probably play this card as uh, just a maybe a big card. Uh, maybe you won't play it in control, but a lot of red decks, as I said, are going to be aggressive or aggressively slanted. It's also a giant for those synergies, and uh, it can do some really good work. Plus one plus zero means that the cards aren't going to inherently like. A lot of the time, they'll still trade for the same things they would have traded for. Uh, but sometimes it can make the uh, blocks a little bit harder for them if they were relying on like one or two big creatures to keep back your swarm of three twos. All of a sudden you just swoop in and crush them. So it's board state dependent and the things like that, but it can definitely end a lot of games. Um, nice little top end card. Probably going to be a C plus or maybe even in the B minus range, depending on how wide a lot of the red decks are going. And by go wide, I mean like how many creatures you have in play at a time. Next is Dual Strike. I gave this card a D. It just seems too, like, it's kind of, there's a lot of good cards you can copy with this, but it feels like it's going to be like narrow because if you like draw your good spell before you draw dual strike, all of a sudden you're in trouble and you have to like have the extra mana to play this on the same turn and then foretelling it like is like kind of rough. So I think it's just going to be a D. Next is Dwarven Hammer. Just a, gave this a C or maybe actually I think I think this is like a C plus even because giving a creature plus three plus oh and trample just makes all of your creatures pretty scary and a five mana five one trampler is like not a terrible body and so the fact that you can uh, then just make all of your creatures massive is pretty nice so dwarven hammer gets a nice c plus grade from me next is dwarven reinforcements uh, pretty nice little way to um card to have foretell because if you don't have a two drop then you foretell this on turn two then on turn three you can play the foretell and get a couple creatures on the board to start your the, the engine's running. It also works well with some of the go wide cards, like the inspired charge variant that we saw in white, the um, five mana plus two plus one to everything, because that can work really well with token makers. And so dwarven reinforcements could be a nice little key part of that deck. So I think it's gonna be a rock solid C. Next is a fearless liberator. I gave this a C plus. If you play this on turn two and then attack on turn three, you're most of the time gonna wanna use the boast to make sure that you get the value while you can. And then you're essentially getting the card that we just saw, but it, um, was attached to a two drop and then it even has extra upside because then if you can keep attacking you can keep making two ones and uh, it works pretty well with equipments that you can put on it or if you can give it flying or things like that so i think it's a pretty good card in a c plus but a two one is obviously pretty fragile maybe that with all these one toughness creatures that we've been seeing maybe the uh 
like one two first strike falcon gets a little bit better the one that i kind of was unsure how it would look um until i'm like actually talking about the cards i'm maybe not noticing how many one toughness creatures there are but there'll be more analysis on that so that i'm sure somebody will do the math on how many one toughness creatures there are and if there are a decent number it'll get played it'll be adopted but yeah fearless pup is next this card i gave it a d it's just pretty low impact uh a one one first strike might just actually be a good body in this format depending on the number of one toughness creatures and the fact that it can attack as a three powered first striker is pretty nice uh in the middle stage of the game or when you've already got enough mana because uh like a three powered first striker is kind of hard to block sometimes but generally it's going to be not a card you're in love with playing because it's pretty expensive to use so i'm giving this a d to start with though it would be pretty sweet if you could just play a lot of these cards because it is a pretty cool little card i like the idea behind it Ooh. <laughs> Next is Frenzied Raider. I gave this a C plus. A 2-2 two -two that has a chance of becoming a 3-3 three -three relatively easily if you have some other boast cards is like just a pretty decent card, I think. And uh, even in situations where this can't attack, there are going to be spots where your other boast cards can attack and then this slowly grows into a good range. So I think it's going to be like a nice two drop to pick up for your boast deck. Next is Frostbite. I actually gave this a B minus. Having three other snow permanents is not going to be that hard. If you have some snow lands and then just a couple snow creatures in your deck, uh, then you'll be able to deal three with this credit consistently. And Shock is sometimes already a very good card, and there are a decent number of three twos running around, I think. Um, so the fact that this can do two or sometimes even three is really good, and it's actually like pretty uh, just a, a very good card. Um, so yeah, pretty nice B minus there for Frostbite. One of the better Shock variants we've seen. Not being able to hit face isn't that big of a downside when compared to the upside of being able to deal three to some other creatures. I don't really know what's going on in the art. Pretty brutal stuff there. That's a terrifying prospect. It's a bit nippy out there. Jeez Louise, horrible pun. Yikes. Next up is Haggai Mob. It's the card that really works well with the black um, rune to get death touch. I think it's going to be pretty nice. There are a decent number of X1s in the format or cards that make 1-1 spirit tokens or things like that. So I think the one damage is going to be nice and it'll just end up being a C. If it turns out that the one damage isn't very good, um, it'll probably be a like C-, minus, but... A 5 mana 5-4 doesn't need all that much to be good, and uh, it is expensive, but I think it's just the type of 5-drop that you're going to end up playing. Maybe you get to C-minus just because you don't really need to prioritize 5-drops, but I think it's one that you'll be pretty happy playing in your deck. Grog. <laughs> Some of these flavor texts are just inspired. Next up is Immersturm Raider. I like this one a lot. It reminds me of Fisher Wizard from Zendikar Rising because it's like a functional reprint, except it's not a relevant creature type. Uh, so I think it'll end up being a C. Just a two mana, two one that has some nice upside of helping you avoid flood in the late game is exactly what you want. And the art is super cool looking. Gosh, I just really like the artwork on this one. But yeah, I think it'll be a C. Next is Open the Omen Paths. This card has a lot of text, sounds kind of confusing, and it's just an F. You can't really afford to put a card that gives creatures plus one plus zero until the end of turning your deck, and the like weird ritual effect is not worth a card anyway, because like you can just wait a turn and play your your four drop on turn four, and you if you draw this not on turn three, then it doesn't you would never use the ritual anyway, really. So yeah, and you're not going to pay a card to put a plus one plus zero for all your creatures for a turn, so just going to give this an F. Next is Provoke the Trolls. I gave this a C. It's got some nice, uh, it's like a pretty clunky removal spell, but it's also got the upside of just buffing one of your unblocked like six sixes and hitting them for an extra five damage, which is not irrelevant. So uh, I gave it a C, even though typically four mana to deal three damage might be like a C minus. So nice little card that design there. <laughs> I need to read the flavor text. I haven't read it yet. Oh my gosh, I like burning and pillaging as much as anyone, but sometimes it's just easier to throw a rock and let the trolls do the work. <laughs> so the idea is they like throw a rock at a troll and then the troll just gets pissed off and destroys the town. That's wild. Next is Run Amok. For an aggressive deck, Run Amok is going to be like a C-level combat trick because plus three plus three and trample is massive. Uh, stats but for a defensive deck it's unplayable so do with that what you will so it'll probably average out to be like a c minus because most red decks are going to be aggressive but if you're not aggressive you don't want this card at all next is rune of speed i gave this a c i think it's again it's pretty nice to have on an equipment because you just being able to able to move the haste around is quite nice but plus one plus oh replaces itself is an aura for relevant things can be nice and sometimes you'll get a nice little speed boost out of it like you'll hold this in your hand for a little bit and then you'll go like four drop rune of speed attack you for six and your opponent actually what forward powered five attack you for five or something like if you're using the giant coward or something and then all of a sudden your opponent's like oh my gosh i took five out of nowhere this was insane 
but yeah, Runer Speed definitely just probably going to be a C, because it does replace itself, so it doesn't need that much to be good. Oh, there we go. Next is Seize of the Spoils. Uh, this card is just going to be like a pretty typical D plus or C minus. It's pretty, I, I think it's probably going to just be a C minus. Um, you're generally not using this sort of thing in the super early game anyway. So the upside of being able to use it on turn three to ramp out a five drop could be nice. Or you can sometimes use this type of effect to fix your mana, which is pretty cool. Like if you have a deck that really wants to, like a red green deck that really wants to splash a blue card or something, and you have like, say, th two C's the spoils in your deck, you can like almost count that as like a mana source because you, like if you're just going to be careful about your treasure usage, which is really nice. So if it can be used as a splash tool, and I think generally it's going to be like a C, C minus level card. Uh, but if you want to splash with it, it can be like a C. Um, and some more aggressive decks aren't going to need this effect as much because they're more like low to the ground and don't want to spin their wheels. So maybe it gets a little worse in those and it's like a D plus in those decks. Next is Shackles of Treachery. Typically, without sack outlets, it'll be a D level card. Uh, if the, your opponent has an equipment, like if it's a D level card that you generally wouldn't put in your deck unless you were super aggressive. If your opponent has some equipment, you could use this as a sideboard card to like get rid of the equipment. And then also if you have some ways to sacrifice the creature, it all of a sudden becomes like a C. Because if you have like four or five ways to sacrifice creatures, I don't know, ex I didn't count the sack outlets yet, which maybe was something I should have done in my prep work, but I did a lot of other stuff, but I just forgot to count the sack outlets. But there's like village rights that can sacrifice a creature. I know that one at least. And if there are enough ways to sacrifice creatures, then you can maybe build this into a sacrifice deck. Um, but I don't know how much support there is for that. I don't think there's as much, maybe. So um, I think typically you're going to be just using this as either a finisher for your ultra aggressive red decks, a sideboard card to take out equipments, or maybe sometimes a extra way to use their sacrifice effects. So I'm probably going to end up being a D a lot of the time or a sideboard card. Next is Smashing Success, uh, which is mostly just a sideboard card. If your opponent has some busted artifact that you have to deal with, um, taking out a land is generally not something you're going to do. Uh, but if your opponent has some cards that like really care about having a certain land, like there's a, a an aura in green that enchants a land and lets it tap for a bonus mana. So if your opponent's really reliant on that for like splashing a bunch of cards or something, maybe you could side in Smashing Success. I certainly want to see that happen. It would be pretty funny. Um, but I think uh, overall it's going to be like a sideboard card, uh, not really one you're going to look to main deck. <laughs> I like the flavor text too. Who said there's no profit in destruction? Because there's a bunch of like rubies flying everywhere. Next up is Squash. I think this card's actually really good. I gave this a C plus uh, because I think it's going to be easier to control a giant than you'd think, thanks to the changeling. So even if you're in like a blue red giants deck, you're going to maybe have a couple of the three mana one four flyer changelings or the four mana two four changeling that can get counters and scry. And then all of a sudden in the mid game squash is just a two mana spell that deals six, which is just going to kill pretty much anything. So I gave this a C plus. And even just casting this for five mana is not that unreasonable. A five mana deal six is just a solid removal spell. And the upside of casting it for two mana is really quite nice. And you don't even need to be like blue red giants. You can just be like red green or just any deck that has changelings and get that upside sometimes. In green, there's a couple of two mana changelings changelings and so you can just use squash with those and uh start casting it for two mana and even the the downside of casting it for five is not that bad like a five mana deal six would probably be a c minus and the fact that you can cast this for two mana a decent portion of the time makes this i think a c plus so which is which is quite a nice little removal spell next up is tormentor's helm i'm starting out with this at c minus if you're an aggressive deck being able to give your creatures plus one plus one and uh, ping them when they like trade off is pretty nice. That extra one damage can really add up. And like it works pretty well with like the two ones, like the four mana card that makes a couple two ones, because then you're attacking with some three twos. And like if you have a couple, it, uh, funnily enough, if you have a couple of Tormentor's Helms, it's like kind of scary for your opponent. Like imagine if you have, just humor me for a moment, imagine you have three Tormentor's Helms in play. And so every little creature you play is all of a sudden like a five five that deals three if it gets blocked. I mean, it's hard to do that, but I like on a, even on a smaller scale, it can definitely be a pretty scary card. Dep Short Sword is like a colorless version of this that doesn't have the pinging involved. And in course of 2021, that was a totally reasonable card to put in your deck. And the extra ping, I think, is pretty relevant. And there could be some equipment themes in this set. Um, Short Sword has also been horrific in the past. Like in Dominaria, it was a card you didn't want to touch with a six foot pole or six foot sword in that case. But. Um, I think Tormentor's Helm has some potential and the pinging could be relevant. And I think putting a couple copies in a deck that has some equipment synergies could be pretty nice. Or just a deck that has some medium-sized cre creatures that are going to be able to trade off in combat and the ping would add up.
Next up is to scary firewalker. I think this card's pretty nice. I think it's going to end up being like a C plus because a three mana three two that can attack and then potentially draw you a card when you activate the boast. I feel like you're going to activate the boast a lot of the time. It's pretty nice to make this card really good. You're going to want to have a lot of cheap cards in your deck, but it can also just play the land. So if you exile the top card and it's a land, uh, you can cast it. So I mean, not cast the land, but play the land because it says play not cast, which is really a nice distinction. So I think it's going to be a C plus. It's a really nice card and. Uh, pretty cheap boast cost that can maybe get you some card advantage and if it survives it can even like net you a couple cards so pretty cool design i really like it next up is a vault robber i gave this card a d plus because i feel like most red decks aren't going to care about a one three as much um getting a treasure token can be nice sometimes but i feel like that's more of a defensive thing whereas red is going to be more of an aggressive color so i gave it a d plus but if you really need treasure for splashing or something like that then maybe it gets a little bit better I believe that's the last red card. Yes, it is the last red card. We are not in the world of the black cards where there's a bunch of W's and V's and all these wild things. Once we get to the, what's the card called again? The Vault Robber, we can move on to the green cards. We are reaching a excellent point for a water break in this. Um, my water ball, bottle is kind of a green color, so it's on theme for the video. But. Uh, okay, let's start off with Arachnoform. I gave this card a D minus because I think there's some decks where putting a plus two plus two aura in your deck could be okay. There are some sort of cheesy strategies that almost that are often going to exist in this sort of format, where you can use a card like Arachnoform uh, to like kind of be off meta. So, for example. Uh, combining Arachnoform with the one mana, one, two flyer in white, all of a sudden you're attacking them with a three, four first strike flyer on turn two of the game. And some strategies, like once the meta develops to a point, like this is a lot of discussion for a card that's like, a, I gave a D minus to, but it's fun to talk about. There's sometimes a uh, situation in a format where the format has slowed down because the aggressive decks can't make headway. And then all of a sudden, if you just so you'll just get arachnoform super late and then you just end up going to a spot where you put an arachnoform on your one two flyer and then the next turn you're just hitting them with a three four and all the removal spells cost like a little bit more or they can't deal four for a little bit or things like that and then you just kind of beat them down so it has some some small potential there so i gave it a d minus but pretty much a card you're not going to want to touch next up is blizzard brawl this one gets a pretty big uh, improvement if you do have a lot of snow in your deck so try to prioritize snow if you have it but the downside the low case is like a prey upon which is depending on the format like a c a lot of the time and this has some pretty nice upside so i gave it a c plus um pretty cool design as well <laughs> i like the idea that of humans always fighting bears ever since like tarkir where there was like savage punch it's just been like, like a funny thing but this guy's using an axe instead of his fist so maybe a little bit less fair um Next up is Boreal Outrider. I gave this a B minus. This card is really sweet if you are building a snow deck uh, because it just gives all of your extra creatures that you cast after it an additional counter, which is just really good. So if you have some snow lands and uh, like you have to have like the snow lands of that color. So you have to, if you're like a blue green snow deck, you'd have to have a snow island and a snow forest to really get all the counters that you want. But I don't think that's going to be as hard if you're really prioritizing them. And this card is really worth building around. So it's like a B minus, I think. Next up is Broken Wings. This is a pretty good sideboard card, but it's not really... A, and it's sometimes a card you can main deck depending on the format. Like if there's a lot of flyers running around, if the sagas are super big deal, um, if there's some, enough enchantment removal, uh, you can main deck this sort of card. But it's generally just going to be a good sideboard card or sometimes a main deckable card that you'll play if your deck has a particular weakness. Next up is Elderleaf Mentor. I like this uh, effect to make two tokens. Uh, having some go-wide synergies is really nice in a set. It makes it more interesting gameplay a lot of the time. And so there could be some nice stuff with this and the like Inspired Charge variant that we saw in white earlier. Uh, four mana for a 3-2 and a 1-1. One, one. It's just going to end up being a C-level card. Pretty reasonable uh, bodies and uh, pretty good on defense for trading off with the like two ones and four threes and things like that of the world. Next up is Elven Bow. I actually think this card is pretty good. Uh, one of the reasons I like it is because green decks can struggle with flyers. And so sometimes you're playing a green deck and then you like jam your reach creature into play and you're like, well, if this dies, I'm screwed. But with the case of Elven Bow, if they kill it, you just equip to something else. And then you just always have an answer to flyers. So I gave this a C plus because it addresses one of the big issues with green, even though a three mana, two, three reach is generally not that good. Just the fact that you can equip it and make your creatures have reach is really nice. And plus one, plus two is nothing to scoff at either. And elf synergy. So if there is going to be a massive, a little bit of elf synergy running around. So I gave it a C plus. I like the card. 
Next up is Finn the Fang Bearer. A two mana one three death touch. Poison's not going to come up really often in draft, but it's going to be really funny when someone dies to poison in limited. It's going to be actually hilarious. Um, but yeah, it's not like an infect damage. It's a little bit different than infect. Uh, but if you hit someone with <laughs> with Finn uh, like five times, they die. If you combine it with like the four mana two three flying haste death touch in black to get the extra poison, it'd be really funny. Um, so yeah, it'll be really cool to get that working. But I think generally it's just a C. A one three death touch is uh, for two mana is just a pretty good defensive body. And uh, the rest is just kind of flavor text essentially because poison's not going to really ever come up. Um, I hope it does, but it's not really going to happen. But yeah, so just going to give it a C. Uh, maybe if, yeah, I'm just going to see. There's not really not much ifs, ands, or, or, or buts about it. Next up is Glittering Frost. This is a card I referred to earlier when talking about the land destruction spell. It's pretty a good card for a snow deck because it can make your uh, one another land into a snow, and some of the cards really care about like tapping snow mana specifically. Um, it works really well with another card we're going to look at that can untap a snow land, so you can let, get double your mana from that. And uh, it's nice that you can add an initial mana of any color, so you can like uh, splash whatever you want. Like maybe you're playing a snow deck and you have two of these in your deck, and all of a sudden you're splashing like one blue card and one red card for like removal effects or something like that, or a super good synergy effect. So I like that element of it. It is a bit expensive. It's more of a controlling card, so I think it generally just still gets like a C minus because it is slow, but it does ramp you. So if you're playing a ramp deck, you'll like it. But if you're an aggressive beatdown deck, you're not going to want it. So I gave it a C minus for that reason or um yeah or d plus if the for if the rest of the format is really aggressive and you can't afford to spend turn three doing this it could also just be like a d plus but it's a seems like a really good enabler for some cool strategies and also cool artwork again next up is not bold recluse the spiders are finally coming out in force with some actual power usually it's like a three mana one four a three mana four two is much better this is a great tool for an aggressive deck and i think it's just going to be like a c minus level card or a c uh four two is just generally decent stats oftentimes it does trade with a two with a two drop so generally that makes it a c minus but it could be a, a little bit better if uh the format lines up well for it so it's probably a c minus next up is grizzled outrider five mana five five it's an elf i gave this a c i could see giving it a little bit lower but a five mana five five is just generally pretty decent stats um and in the past cards like colossopede which were five mana five fives with no other text were like generally cards that i was relatively happy to play they're just solid playables uh, i could see it being a c minus but i think being an elf might be relevant so i gave it a c and we'll see how it does next is guardian glade walker another card that i gave a c this is a pretty key card for changeling type decks or decks that care about creature types it's one of the changelings i mentioned when i was talking about squash uh, because if you have this in play, then all of a sudden your squash only costs two mana. Um, the card itself, it may, may be a little bit weak, but it's like the flexibility of being able to put the counter wherever you want and being a changeling, I think is enough upside to make this card a C. Next is Horizon Seeker. This is a really cool design as well. They have some super cool designs in this set. I'm so excited to play with these cards. Uh, Horizon Seeker is going to be a C plus, I think. Uh, a three mana, three, two, it, and then you can attack and draw a card. Uh, essentially like you, and you can use it to fix your mana if you are attacking and uh able to boast with it you can like get a splash color if you want i think green decks can often splash maybe potentially <laughs> they can often splash maybe potentially that's like a great statement isn't it but i think they'll be able to splash if they want to and uh horizon seekers are really good tool for doing that and if you have like a combat trick to keep it alive then you can even get some card advantage from it so that's some extra little incentive there too so if you for example have like the plus one plus three and flying card from white and so you go like play your horizon seeker on turn three then on turn four you attack use the boast ability they block you give it plus one plus three you kill their creature you get that extra land and the next turn you can kind of get another land that's just really good so horizon seeker i think it's going to be really sweet i gave it a c plus next is ice hide troll another card that i gave a c plus two on the condition that you have enough snow lands because indestructible is a messed up mechanic it really makes uh attacking into it tough because what you do is you block and then in response you uh use the ability and so all of a sudden you're blocking with a 4-3 indestructible you can also use it after attacking you don't have to like tap it as part of the cost so you can go like attack they block you give it plus two plus oh and indestructible what it's not good for what like the reason that the tap thing is there is because if your opponent uses removal on it uh before combat you're not going to be also able to block with it so they can like tap it for that reason but indestructible should not be underestimated two mana is not that much to hold up in the mid to late game uh for to have an indestructible creature whenever you want and uh if you have enough snow lands to facilitate this this is going to be a good card so i gave it a c plus um especially because 
oftentimes by the time you're going to be able to activate this you'll have drawn deep enough into your deck to find the two snow lands you need because uh, you're not going to be activating this super early in the game a lot of the time the threat of activation is real because if you attack with this on turn four into their like four four they're not going to be able to block so yeah then you can just develop your own board if you have the snow lands so it gets mu it gets better if you have more snow lands but it's just i think it's a c plus if you ha do have the snow lands to support it this is why prioritizing snow lands is important but yeah next is, is jespera sentinel i gave this card a d minus just because it's really clunky and like small for what you're paying for it uh, a one mana one two is even if it does have reach and the ability to like maybe ramp you a little bit is just too low impact of a card i think generally and so i gave just bar sentinel a d minus uh if it being an elf is super relevant maybe it gets a little bit of a boost but um there was a card called loam dryad that was very similar to this except without being like a relevant creature type and i don't think it had reach and that card wasn't great uh i will also say that if you have a couple of like raven forms in your deck maybe playing jasper sentinels more uh it gets a little bit of a boost or maybe a d minus to a d because if you're turning your opponent's big creatures into one one flyers having a one two reach is kind of what you need so it maybe gets a boost if you have that going for you but generally not a great card uh, I had something in my throat. Sorry about that. Next up is King Harald's Revenge. Uh, this card is kind of deeply mediocre. I think I gave this a D, but that was, uh, yeah, partly. It's like a cool design. You give the creature plus one, plus one. Every, uh, wait, what? Oh my gosh, I misread this card. There are cards that I misread, chat, and luckily I realized that before. It gets plus one, plus one for each creature you control. I missed the for each creature you control the first time, so I'll have to do this one on the fly a little bit. I was like, oh gosh, this card only gets plus one, plus one. But if you have like three creatures, you can plus two, plus three. Oh my gosh, that is sick. Previously, my my big spiel with this card was that King Harold's Revenge is a sweet combo with the Ice Hide Troll. Because like you can give you can give the troll a, a little bit of a stat boost, make them block it, and then give it indestructible when they're blocking it so you don't even lose your creature. But this card needs a little bit of reevaluation. I think I'm going to move up on my grade to a D+. Because if you, say, have three creatures in play, and you give your 3-3 three, three, plus 3 plus 3 and make it be blocked by everything, you'll maybe kill two of your opponent's creatures, so you get some nice value that way. And there's the up extra upside of um, being able to just alpha strike when the board is um, pretty full. And the Ice Hide Troll combo is also really pretty relevant because they're both commons. So I'm going to give this a D+. Plus. Good work, King Harold's Revenge. You got a little boost by me rereading you. Let's go. I'm I'm with so many cards that I've been reading, I'm sure that I must have misread one of them. I almost always do. <laughs> but it feels good to catch one. Let's go. Yeah, nice little D plus upgrade there. It's not still not broken or anything because it needs some setup cost, and you don't ever really want more than one of these in your deck. Uh because like you're gonna not you're just gonna have them in, in situations where you can't really afford to use them. And if your opponent's creatures are all attacking you, then they won't be able to block or things like that. So it's kind of narrow, but if you have a deck that can go wide, stall the board a little bit, this can either be a win con. One of the things you can do is like put it on a 1-1 one -one token and then attack with all your other creatures and kill them that way. Or you can like put it on your ice hide troll, or you can put it on their, your big creature and then like kill all their little creatures and like get a nice, nice little bit of value that way. But yeah, pretty cool. A little D plus there. A lot of discussion on this one, but I'm just happy that I reread the card. Next up is Lityara Glade Warden. This one is quite good. I think I gave this a B minus just because in the mid game, if you have a couple creatures in your graveyard, being able to put like four counters on your creatures is really good. It being a changeling is relevant. And I think that overall, this is just a really sweet design. Four mana three, three is generally a little bit understated, but having such a good ability is uh, really nice. It can only be used at a sorcery speed. So you can't use it as a combat trick. So keep that in mind, but you can uh, like use this pretty effectively to like grow your creatures, I think. So I gave this a B minus. Maybe it ends up being a C plus because you can't like hold up your mana and then do it on their end step. But I like the extra ability to like use your creatures to like grow something else. So if the board stalls out, you get a nice little bonus. So B minus or maybe a C plus, but I'm leaning towards B minus at the moment. Next up is Mammoth Growth. This is a really cool combat trick. I actually like it a decent amount because being able to cast one pen, spend one mana for plus four plus four is going to be really good. It helps you protect your creatures from the red burn spells. Uh, it also helps you like win combat with some of your boast creatures because maybe you pay boast to get a good ability like the one where you can get a land from your deck the horizon seeker or whatever that card's called and uh, you like use the boast cost and then they block it and all of a sudden you can use your foretelled plus four plus four to like win that combat so having the ability to cast it for cheaper is really nice and then three mana for plus four plus four in a pinch isn't that bad either so i think i gave this uh, a c 
or a C minus. Uh, eh, let's see. What should I give it? I think we should give it a C. I think it's going to be a pretty decent combat trick. You're going to be pretty happy to play one copy in your deck. And so sub, like the first copy is maybe a C and then a subsequent copy is a C minus or something. But also just the fact that your foretell card, I think diverse foretell cards is going to be a good thing to have. So if you have like three different foretell cards in your deck, it's better than having three of the same one potentially, unless they're all super good, but unless it's all like the best foretell spell or something. But like having some diverse ones so your opponent doesn't know what to play around is kind of nice. And so the fact that this is like a nice little different angle of attack for foretell is nice so i think the first copy is going to be like a c next up is mask vandal this is the other two mana changeling i was talking about when i was referring to squash uh this card's really good uh there's going to be a lot of random so like enchantments running around because of sagas and those are generally going to be coming out in the mid game when you'll have a creature in your graveyard to use mask vandal uh sure they'll get the first chapter but stopping the other chapters is still nice uh there's also some enchant removal in blue and white and uh overall and there's also some equipment so i think mass vandal is going to be quite good it might even just be a c plus because of all the stuff running around um it is a little bit hard to use and it's a little bit clunky um if you don't have creatures in your graveyard but i think i'm going to start off with like c plus for mask vandal just because being able to blow up their thing even if it is attached to a one three is still pretty nice and the fact that it's a changeling is nice as well so i think it might be the classic case of like the first copy is a c plus just because it's such a nice flexible effect to have in your deck and then the second copy is a c and things like that but being a changeling is also nothing to be scoffed at either so i think it's gonna be a pretty reasonable card um c or c plus probably a c plus for the first copy next up is path to the world tree this was a really interesting design as well i, I wanted to give it a c just because i think that there could be a five color snow deck there is the um what's the card i don't remember all the card names i'm sorry <laughs> i apologize i forgot the card names but there's the three mana enchantment that you can make it land into a snow land and then tap it and get whatever colors you want and so maybe there is some and there's the horizon seeker card uh that can search up land so maybe there is support for a five color deck uh i want it to be true so if there is a five color deck this is going to be a nice payoff for it it's a really sweet card um and if you are playing a five color deck this is going to be like maybe a b minus in your deck because it's like a great payoff at common spend seven mana get a ton of value even if they're all little incremental things you uh get a ton of value from this and you get to get the land as well so it's like a bunch of value so it's like a b minus if you there's a, if you're in a five color deck but other than that it's like a d it, it's like a d level card if you want to get a land to splash so like if you're playing a like red green deck and trying to splash a black card then path to the world tree being able to be like two mana to go grab your swamp is like decent so you maybe you'll play it as like a d level card then uh, but if you're playing a five color deck it gets to be like a b minus so keep those things in mind it's pretty much a, a build around card this is where the build around asterisk really comes into play even though it's not unplayable outside of a five color deck next up is a ravenous lindworm i think this is going to be a c level card it's pretty much a honey mammoth reprint from icoria and honey mammoth really overperformed um that was maybe potentially format dependent though so i'm not going to be like over the moon about this card but I think a six mana six six that gains you four life has some history and i'm pretty excited to play this card it's a really cool design and i'm going to start with it at a c level card because it's kind of what you want out of a six drop it like get, gains you some life so even if they kill it you get a nice little benefit and like if you jam multiple th of these in a row your opponent's in real trouble so it's probably going to be a c if you're like a ramp deck and then if you're more like low to the ground green deck it's like a c minus that you're not super thrilled to play but it's going to be a pretty nice card for the more controlling ramping green deck so i'm going to start with it at a c next up is rootless you the perfect card to go with your ravenous lindworm <laughs> uh i gave this a b plus if you're playing a deck that has some big creatures in it uh being able to curve five drop into six drop very consistently is going to be nice and so i gave this a c plus because of that also a five mana five four is not just like not a bad body on its own so even if you don't have all that many targets and you maybe drew your target before you cast this it's not the end of the world um but a f five mana five four that draws a card is great so it's just like a c plus and if you have a really good creature to go get it's like a b minus because you get to fetch out your bomb rare or something like that so keep that in mind if you have a bomb rare to go get then the rootless you goes up in your pick order or your priority list or however you determine which card to take in a pack you should take it a little higher if you have a good card to get with toughness or power six or greater next up is root of wisdom this card my first thought was oh this card's going to obviously be like terrible because mill three cards return a land or elf doesn't strike me as very good but i think the card actually has some potential if you are synergizing it with the cards that say like exile a creature card from your graveyard like the masked vandal and so if you have a couple cards that care about exiling a card from your graveyard or if you have maybe a, in your a black green deck where you have the draugr 
card that re returns two creatures if they share a type. Having a little bit of self mill could be really nice. So in that case, it's like instead of being like an F, it's maybe a D or a D plus in certain decks. You can like definitely get some graveyard synergies going potentially. And in those cases, Roots of Wisdom is a card you're okay playing on turn two to help you find a land. But and there's like little downside because even if you miss on it, then you can still draw a card. But I would say that generally it's going to be a D or a, a D in the decks that have some synergy with it and like an F in other decks. And if you have like a bomb rare elf, maybe it gets a little bit better as well. Next up is Rune of Might. I gave this a C or maybe a C plus depending on the context of your deck. Being able to put this on something like a Lindworm is going to be really nice to make it into a Trampler. If you have a lot of big creatures, having a Trampler is nice. Uh, plus one, plus one in Trample is really just a reasonable card. It's like pretty much a similar card to Satessin Training from Theros Beyond Death, which was plus one, plus zero oh in Trample and you drew a card. Uh, being able to put this on an equipment is a nice upside. Being able to get that extra toughness is a nice upside. So it's probably going to end up being a C plus uh, more so than a C, but uh, it's going to depend on if you have big creatures to put it on because Trample is the type of mechanic that works better on like big dumb creatures like the ravenous lindworm no offense to the lindworm's intelligence of course but yeah probably going to be a c plus level card in the bigger green decks and a c in the smaller ones because it's less good to give a creature trample uh and just giving plus one plus one is not too impressive and i think as with all of the runes putting it onto another equipment is going to be pretty nice so um yeah but you don't want to put bad equipment in your deck just for the runes purposes i don't think next up is several packmate I think this is going to be a C plus. I almost wanted to go B minus, but B minus is a little bit maybe hard to do. It is a format three three that draws you a card, which is quite good, uh, and it has foretell synergies, which I do like a lot. Um, so maybe it does get into the B minus territory, but I think it's the best green common. It's my contender for best green common, and uh, I, I I made sure to like look up which card I thought was the best common for each color when I was before I went through because I wanted to be able to say this is my pick for best green common. But yeah, I think it's going to be a B minus a lot of the time. Um, it's just a lot of good value. Um, but there's also just it, it's like Jiraga Visionary but with an extra toughness and foretell, which means that you can sometimes just go turn two play this foretell turn three cast it, which is just a really nice thing. So I'm going to give this a B minus. It's going to make me want to play a green deck, which is my, kind of my criteria for a B. It's like a weak pull into green rather than a strong pull into green as like a full D would be. But yeah, it's like a really good card. Next up is Sculptor of Winter. This is a rock solid C. If you have some snow lands, it's really good. And if you have the snow land that taps for uh, multiple mana, like if you've got the uh, enchantment on it, it's like a nice little combo as well. Um, so it's going to be a C. Uh, you do need to make sure you have some snow lands in your deck so that you can consistently use this in the early game by having a snow land to use. But even if you don't, it's a two mana two, two. So you don't need that much extra upside to make it good. And it's a snow creature. So pretty solid C. Next up is Snakeskin Veil. This is like a Hunter's Mark, which is a uh, card that is a pretty reasonable. I think it's called Hunter's Mark. But yeah, it's a card. No, it's called Ranger's Guile. What was I thinking? Yeah, Ranger's Guile from like course at 2021 and other sets where it gave plus one plus one and hexproof, uh, but the plus one plus one wasn't permanent. And that card was generally reasonable to play. And since the counter is permanent here, I gave this a C because in the situations where you end up killing their creature, it's going to be really good. And if you're using like, as I was saying with like the Horizon Seeker or whatever, um, if you like attack your three two into like a two two, and then use a snakeskin like boast it and use a snakeskin veil or something like that, you're gonna be in really good shape. So cheap tricks get a little bit of a bump. Uh, if the creatures trade off, it's uh, like if you can like win a combat with this, you just win the game. And you can also just like use it to protect your creature from removal and uh, get a permanent counter. So I think it's gonna be a C. At least the first copy pretty good in your deck. Next up is Spirit of the Alder Guard. I ended up giving this a C, but in a dedicated snow deck, it's much better than a C. And in a deck that has no snow, it's like a blank. So when you're in the drafting portion, you need to be careful about taking this card if you're not willing to commit to snow, because if this is a four mana zero four in your deck, it's gonna be terrible. If it's a four mana like three four that draws you a snow land, it's gonna be actually pretty good. So in a snow deck, it's like a B minus. And in a non-snow deck, it's like an F. So do with that what you will and then it's like got gradations based on how many like if you have three snow lands in your deck and a couple of snow permanents it's probably like a, a c so i think it's going to be hard to be a perfect snow deck because other people are probably going to compete for snow cards but the the spirit of the older guard is going to be a pretty good card for snow decks is what i will say this is where giving the card a c isn't really uh reflective of its grade so i'll give it a build around b minus if you really put in the work but it's still playable outside of that if you have a couple of snow permanents uh, to go get. Like a 4-mana 3-4 that draws you a land is still a good card. 
or four mana two four even that draws you a land is a pretty good card still but you just need to make sure you have enough snow to make it work so probably a c plus in most cases in most decks it's probably going to be a c plus because you'll probably be able to get a couple of snow lands and then it'll probably be a b minus or a b maybe it's a build around b because like a four imagine this being a four mana five four or something like that yeah <laughs> when i was grading cards before this to like help me like not be completely blind on the cards i think i gave this a c but the more i talk about it the more i'm like well even the worst decks are probably going to be able to get like two snow lands or the decks that don't care about snow at all are probably going to be able to get like one or two and so even then it's like a four mana like three two four though i guess it's not two four unless you have the other land to play so probably default to like a c plus in a lot of decks but it can go all the way up to a b and all the way down to like a d or an f so wide gradation on spirit of the older guard it's like a build around card for sure Next up is Struggle for Skemfar. This is another card that was a contender for top green common. It got narrowly edged out by the wolf. I think this is going to be a C plus, or it's kind of just like right behind the wolf. Having Fortell is a nice upside on this. Sorry about that. Having Fortell is a nice upside on this card. And it's also nice to be able to, um, like, Fortell this on turn two. Turn three, you play a creature. And then turn four, you, like, Fortell this when they're, like, and then play another three creature or like you like foretell this early and then later on in the game you play like your four drop and immediately use it to fight when they're tapped out those sorts of things are really good for this sort of card so it's like really in contention for top green common i could easily see it dethroning the wolf but i think it's probably going to end up being like a b minus level card just because a one mana spell that puts a counter on a creature and fights is really nice even though it some, needs some setup. So if your deck doesn't have a lot of creatures or your creatures are small or your opponent has a lot of removal, it gets worse. But I think it's generally going to be a C plus or B minus level card. And I'm leaning towards B minus right now, um, judging just by some of the other cards. That, like It works really well with just like reasonably dotted green creatures. So I think Struggle for Scam card is a good card. Next up, is, we're getting to the gold cards. We're almost through the set review. Uh, next up is Agar, the Freezing Flame. This card I gave a grade of a B minus two. Um, it's really good. It is a gold card, so you can be a little bit less aggressive taking it. But uh, a 3 mana 3 3 that can sometimes draw you cards is just a really good deal. And it's pretty much a must kill threat because there are some big giants. So if they chump block them ever, if you have, and some of the red removal spells are like deal fours or deal six in the case of squash. So pretty, uh, or like sometimes you'll be deal dealing three with your frost shock or whatever, whatever, frostbite. So yeah. I think it's a good card. It's like a B minus, but once you're in blue red, it's like a B and you're really happy to take it. Next up is Arnie slays the troll. I started off with this at a C plus. Sometimes you're not going to be able to use it to fight a creature. Um, you need to have, make sure you have a bigger creature than their creature. But if your deck has a lot of big creatures, then this card gets to be like a B minus because um, as someone put it, it's like a inscription of um, abundance. Dang. What's the name of it? It was the green inscription from Zendikar rising, but it's in like one at a time and in reverse, like, fight the creature put a counter put two counters and then gain life so really a powerful effect um not doing it all at once is definitely worse but being able to like do have this is really nice and the ramp can be relevant as well the second saga adding red means that you can start casting four drops at, uh, like you can cast like a six drop maybe because you're gonna probably go like three drop and then on turn four you play arnie slays the troll along with another two drop and then on the next turn you play like a six drop which can be really nice so i think arnie slays the troll it's like a b minus in most red green decks Next up is Ascent of the Worthy. I think this is going to be like a C. It's a really weird design, um, but the first two Saga's effects are like really difficult to evaluate how useful that's going to be um, because you have to have like a creature that's big enough to withstand the hit. It can let you enable some attacks. So if you have like a 4-4 four, four, and they have a 3-3, three, three, I, I don't even know how it enables it. Like sometimes, like if you have a creature you don't mind like sacrificing for the cause almost, then you can attack like a bunch of 3-3s three, three's into their 3-3s three, three's, and then like have a 2-2 two, two that you leave behind to die. So that can be really good. So if you have like that sort of board state, it's like better than a C. But there's also some board states where you're really behind. I guess it's decent when you're behind too, because you can make like a massive block on a creature. The real downside is that if your opponent like bounces the creature that you've designated, then you can really blow you out. So that's and they see it coming from a mile away because of the saga. So that's the downside. It's probably gonna be a C plus though, because getting a creature back is still pretty good too. Um and yeah, once the board is stalled, it's pretty reasonable. This is one of the hardest cards to evaluate. I'm going to give it a C plus, though. I think it has some upside potential. Next up is Binding of the Old Gods. I gave this card um, a B a B level. I think it's going to be a B. Because um, part of the upside is that you can um, bounce it back to your hand as a saga. You can also potentially like 
yeah, get just a lot of value. You kill a creature, get a land, and then giving your creatures death touches far from irrelevant. So especially if you're like a go wide deck or you have some token stuff or some small elves running around. So just like a B level card, really good. Being able to destroy any non land permanent is also really relevant sometimes. So Binding of the Old Gods is great. One thing you can also do is because the snow duels are um uh basically are do have the land types, you can like get a snow duel from your deck when you're getting the forest card. Uh, so you can even use it to help you splash, which is a nice little upside as well. So if you're playing like a black green deck that wants to splash blue, you can get like, and you can pick up a blue green snow duel, then you're going to be in great shape. So yeah, pretty cool card. I gave it a B. Next up is Fall of the Imposter. I think this card's going to be a C plus. Putting two counters and then killing their biggest creature is just going to be good for three mana, even if it is a little bit slow to do. And uh, the fact that you can put the counters on any creatures you want is nice as well. One thing you can also do that's kind of cute is if your opponent has a creature that's like, if your opponent has two three threes, but there's one you really want to kill, you can make one of them a four four because you can put it on your opponent's creature. That's a little bit of a cute thing to do, um, but I'm not sure how many times you're going to do that, but it's pretty uh, sweet as a, as a little card design thing because it doesn't just say your creatures. So kind of cool. I think it's going to be like a C plus though. Next up is Furia, Judge of Valor. I gave this card a B minus, but pretty much just because it's a gold card. Like, so maybe you're not going to be able to take it as aggressively early on, but this card is fantastic. Four mana, two, four, flying lifelink, already pretty decent. But then you just like, every time you double spell, you get to draw another spell. It's just incredible. So Furia, Judge of Valor, excellent card. Gave it a B minus. But if you're black, white, obviously it's great. It's like a B level card then, or even, even better maybe. Uh, but yeah, just a great top end card for your black white deck. Next up is Forging the Tyrite Sword. This card is just not very good unless you have like a really good equipment to go get. And even then it's a little bit dicey. So I gave this card a build around D because if you have a good equipment to go get, it can actually do some stuff. Um, but if you don't have a good equipment to card, making two tokens, treasure tokens isn't very good. Uh, but the artwork is gorgeous. So that's something. Um, but yeah, if you have a really good equipment, uh, it's like a, a card that you'll put in your deck. But other than that, I guess even then it's like a build around C minus then because you're going to put in your deck if you have an equipment and otherwise you're not going to play it. So it's like an F outside of that. Next up is Harald, King of Skemfa. Or it's Harald. Harald, the King of Skemfa. He is an elf warrior. I think this card's pretty good. I think it, it, this card's like a uh, B minus level card. Uh, looking, You can like oftentimes build your deck to have an elf or a warrior. So a three mana three two that draws you a card is just quite good. And then a three mana three two menace that draws your card is a little bit better than that so it's like a c plus or a b minus depending on how many elves and warriors you have probably um closer to a c plus most of the time because there's always a whiff chance with this so yeah i'm gonna give this a c plus grade um a three two menace for three is like a c and then the fact that it draws you a card some of the amount of the time is gonna get a little grade boost but there's still a miss percentage so give it a c plus not a b minus Next up is Invasion of the Giants. I'm going to start with this at a C grade. I think there's some giant synergies that it can do some really good stuff with. And the worst case scenario is like a very slow, clunky Deliberate, which was a card in Zendikar Rising. Or if you like to think in terms of Preordain, it's like an extra mana cost on Preordain. But Scry 2 and draw a card can give you some nice like stabilization and then um, some nice card filtering. And the make your giant cost two less to cast can actually be really relevant if you have a six mana giant. Because that can actually give you a nice like big advantage like if you have a key six mana giant to play and you jam this invasion on turn two on turn three you draw a card reveal the six mana giant on turn four you just jam a six drop into play that feels like it could be really scary so maybe in most decks it's going to be like a c minus but in decks that have like enough giants to uh like enough expensive giants to like consistently make use of the mana advantage then you can get some nice bonus there or even if you just have a four mana giant being able to go like on turn four four mana giant plus squash something could be nice too i also really just want the card to be good because it's such a sweet design <laughs> so that's biasing me slightly towards like wanting to be like oh but maybe it has all these cool things it's probably just a c minus because its effect is just slow and uh not ter like slow clunky and uh not great outside of the early game <laughs> but yeah probably a c minus or maybe a d plus in a lot of decks but if you build around it it can be like a c minus or a c so we'll give it a a preliminary grade of C minus because I'm an optimist. Next up is Carter Doom Scourge. This card is funny because I looked at it and I was like, wow, this card's good. And then I reread the card and I was like, wow, this card's really good because I didn't realize that it's clause that says whenever an attacking creature dies, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life just works on all attacking creatures instead of just your attacking creatures. So when it enters, they have to attack you with all their creatures. And so you block, kill all their creatures, 
presumably in trades and things like that, hopefully. Or you eat a couple creatures and like let some through. So let's just say you kill two of their creatures. That like not only does it like like it it kills two of their creatures, but you also gain two and they lose two. And then you hit them with your all of your creatures. So they're just so screwed. I feel like Carter Doom Scourge is gonna be like a B because you're gonna be playing a normal game of limited. You're gonna play Carter Doom Scourge. Your opponent's going to have to attack you with all of their creatures. You're going to make all the favorable blocks because Magic the Gathering rules favor blockers. And you're going to deal like three damage to them with that. And then your opponent, and then you're going to like hit them back for like six damage. And even if they have like a blocker, then they'll still take an extra damage every time one of your creatures dies. So it's probably going to just be a B-level card here. Uh, really cool Carter Doom Scourge card. Next up is Carter's Vicious Return. Um, wow. Yeah, classic card. This is one of the like another way to sacrifice creatures so if uh you have a couple of these bad boys in your deck maybe you want to play that uh steal your opponent's creature variant more often uh this type of card also makes you more likely to want to play a token maker or something like that or the like two mana one one that makes your opponent d discard a card those sorts of things but sacrificing a creature to deal three to any target is generally going to be pretty good you can target your opponent's face which is nice and relevant sometimes but generally you're going to be like trade basically trading one of your small creatures for one of their medium-sized creatures which is good um and then each player discards a card like you you'll be able to plan for this so you'll be able to hold an extra land which so maybe this will benefit you more and then returning a creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield it gets a counter in haste it could be really nice so especially if you go out on a limb and like discard a big creature so it'll gain haste that could be really nice but presuming that you have four mana spent on this then on turn five you'll like play a five drop so you won't really be necessarily having too many big creatures but even just getting back a three three making into a four four haste is pretty nice the thing with this card is it's never like explicitly giving you card advantage, but you get like a slight edge every time. And so you're generally going to be pretty happy with this card. I think this card is going to be a, a B minus level card. If you have some sacrifice fodder, um, it does require a little bit of work to have the sacrifice fodder in your deck, but I think it's going to be like a B minus level card when you're uh, enabling it properly. Uh, and if you don't have that many good creatures to sacrifice, it's probably just still like a C plus because it's just a cool card uh, in that way. What a sweet design and the artwork is gorgeous. I love the saga artwork. Next up is Cole, the Forge Master. I'm going to start with this being a C, but if you have some equipments, it gets better. Uh, the It's a really cool design because it makes it really hard to kill your creatures until you've killed Cole. So you like equip one of your creatures, then all of a sudden they just have to kill the call. Um, it also makes like the equipments that make tokens a little bit better because they'll get plus one, plus one. But generally, it's just going to be a C because it's a little bit hard to cast, and you're not going to have that many equipments and auras in your deck. Um, this is the sort of card that does make you more likely to play the marginal auras, like the white one we looked at where it's like a single white man to give a creature plus one plus one and then when it dies you get a spirit if you have coal in your deck you're way more likely to want to put that type of card in your deck because all of a sudden your opponent like is in a predicament because if they kill that creature you're going to get the creature back and so it just gets a little bit better so he can make other cards in your deck better but generally he's going to play out like a c because you're not going to have that many auras and equipments next up is maja bretagard protector uh this is a really cool one i think it's cool it's got pretty neat synergy with the uh that blue card that can give your untapped your creature hexproof as long as it's untapped. Unfortunately, that's another color, but maybe if you're playing a, a blue white deck, you could consider splashing Maja off of something if you if you get the option, because uh, giving all your creatures plus one plus one is really nice. Other creatures and then making a one one every time you play a land is a pretty nice like flood insurance a little bit for a five drop. Um, it is pretty easy to kill, which makes me think that it's probably going to be like a C plus rather than like a B minus just because it's so easy to kill but i do like the card design a lot and it does work well with the potential theme of going wide in green white um if that's a thing so and it works well with the inspired charge variant and things like that so i do like maja i think it's like a c plus but it is fragile so it's going to be hard to get too much value out of this i will say as well there is some benefit to like waiting until turn six to play your maja and go like play maja immediately make a land drop but i wouldn't like worry about it too much because if they kill your maja having a one one's not that relevant uh and if you don't have anything else you're doing then it's better just get into play i think because then you can maybe like play your land drop and do something on your sixth turn as well but yeah maja is a pretty cool design i think a c plus pretty good grade next up is morish of the frost this is one of those classic don't let the gold card fool you moments um i gave this card i think this card is just going to be a c the reason being it's a little bit hard to get um too much like to be like it's only as good as your best creature or your best saga or whatever and a lot of the times those cards are going to cost less than five mana because you are playing them before you play your morit so if you want to curve into this you're going like four drop into morit that's the best case scenario so you're getting a four drop with an extra two counters which is good uh but if you have like only a three drop in play maybe they kill your killed your four drop 
or you didn't or you used removal on turn four all of a sudden you're more it's copying like a three three and it's just getting two counters so i think more it's going to be a c it's a card that's pretty reasonable to play um and sometimes you'll get like crazy value by like copying your six six worm and making it an eight eight but a lot of the time it's going to be just a medium card like maybe you'll copy a two two and it'll be a four four or things like that so and being a changeling can be relevant as well but overall more i think it's going to be a c don't be fooled by gold cards, folks. Even if I did get fooled by Invasion of Giants and gave it a grade, that's probably half a grade too high. Next up is Narfi, Betrayer King. Uh, this card is fantastic. I gave this just a B. If you can't, if you, you're going to want to really prioritize Snow if you have this, because giving all of your Snow creatures a plus one plus one is quite nice. There's also a decent number of zombies in black, so giving all of those plus one plus one is quite nice. And then just returning it over and over and over to the battlefield is just incredible. Even if it does come into play tapped, you can just use this on their end step. Um, you're going to want to prioritize the Snowlands, but this card is fantastic. Absolute house of a limited card, and I just give this a solid B. Just absolute beast it maybe is even a b plus if you have a lot of snow creatures because it's like an anthem on a repeatable creature that's like impossible to kill the fact that blue has like the like even if they the thing is is the only way that this backfires for you is if they have the exile removal spell in black pretty much because then you can't get it back but if you have um like even if they put an aura on it all of your snow creatures are still getting plus one plus one which is pretty relevant because there's a decent number of snow creatures and there's a decent number of zombies so it's still an anthem even if they use even if it can't come back as a four three over and over so this is just a rock solid b it might even be a b plus um maybe just the best uncommon to have in your deck um it is predicated on having enough snow lands to bring it back over and over but if you have a narfi you're going to be taking snow lands very highly so um yeah narfi is fantastic I think, hmm, do I want to gamble and give it a B plus, making it the best uncommon in the set, even if it is a gold card? It is a gold card too, so you, I guess you kind of have to, but it, you can splash it so easily if you're like a green-blue snow deck or a green-black snow deck. Oh, I'm, I, I gave it a B when I was grading it before, but I kind of am tempted to give it a B plus. Heck, we'll just live as live on the bright side of life. We're going to give this card a B plus. It's just completely brutal. Uh, in a mid range matchup, a four three is just a big body. Buffing all your other creatures is relevant, and uh, it comes back over and over. I'm just, it's so good. Yeah, I'm going to give this a B plus. Next up is Nico Defy. Man, I'm I'm so conflicted. B plus B B plus and person B. Uh, I'm going to give it a B plus. Next up is Nico Defy's Destiny. This card I gave I think is just going to be a C. It's a pretty sweet card, um, but it's a little bit tricky to use sometimes, and there are going to be situations where you draw this and just can't do anything with it. Uh, but there are also situations where you're going to have two foretell cards in exile, you'll gain four life, then you'll be able to cast a spell with it, and then you'll be able to return the spell that you cast. So I think it's going to be a reasonable card, and I'm going to give it a C and hope that it works out uh, in most cases, especially for me and not for my opponents. Uh, I think it could be a nice way to stabilize in your foretell decks that are maybe a little bit clunkier. Next is Svela Ice Shaper. This card is fantastic. I really like the design here. It's super cool. It's a three drop that like can like take over the game uh, because you're just going to, once you have this in play, you're basically just going to be making the mana lith every turn, uh, the, the snow mana lith, and then you're going to be using that mana to then use the eight mana ability. So I think this card is going to be just a B um, and it's just going to, also fix your mana so you can like cast whatever spells you want um or like be an aggressively fit the splashing deck things like that so i think it's gonna be like a maybe b minus if it's not like on theme like if you're trying to play a red green beatdown deck maybe svela doesn't fit your deck but i feel like if i if you get a svela you're probably going to want to be more defensive or mid-rangey and try to splash some cards because it is super powerful it's a really cool design i love the theme behind it so i'm going to give this card a b really cool card overall Next up is the Three Seasons. This card is more of a mid-game spell, even though it does cost two mana. Uh, you're going to want to be able to have a couple of your snow creatures trade off, or you're going to want to have a, a lot of snow lands so that if you mill three cards, you're pretty likely to hit. But if it is like a draw two cards, essentially, that are both reasonable spells, um, and then you can shuffle in your the, like good sp other spells that you milled, it's pretty reasonable, I think. Uh, so you can like shuffle in bad cards into your opponent's deck. They oftentimes... Um, you're not going to want to shuffle cards in, but you'll just kind of have to. So I think this card's going to be a C plus because it's pretty good in the mid game. You're not not really going to want to just jam it on turn two, unless you're like infinite snow lands. But pretty sweet card regardless. 
Next up is Trickster's Gods Heist. I think this card's going to be... It's tough to evaluate because it really depends on how many like mediocre to small creatures you have. But I think if you have some of the like 2-mana 1-1 one, one that's like make some discard or some like middling to small creatures, then this card could be decent. But I'm probably just going to give it a C- minus because 4-mana to like exchange creatures is decent. Yeah, probably, I'll just give it a C. It's got enough upside. I'll give it a C. Exchanging creatures is really unreliable and limited because sometimes you just don't have good creatures to exchange. But the fact that you can like exchange creatures that are like for only medium value, like you get you get their three three, you get they get your two two or things, and then you get to still like drain them for three life, and like you get to like take one of their snow lands and uh, target non basic. Oh. Never mind. I misread the second chapter. I thought you could steal their snow land and give them your snow land. Non-basic, non-creature permanence. So you can steal their snow dual land, which it could be good. You can also steal their artifacts and give them like a treasure token. Yeah, I think you're going to be, it's going to be too clunky to really get a ton of value out of this thing consistently. It's really tough. It's mostly you're going to have to rely on the first clause and then the third clause of draining them for three. I feel like a lot of the time it could be a C, like they play a really good card and all of a sudden you just exchange. I'll just give it a C. It's going to be really interesting to see how this one plays out because another thing you can do is you can enchant their creature with an aura and then steal their like other enchantment that's like doing something for them maybe. Yeah, this is a weird one. Real weird. You can also exchange a creature that they put an aura on with one of their creatures, so it's probably going to be a C, C- minus overall. Uh, it's just really hard to get value out of exchanging creatures. But if you build around, it can be a C. Like if you pick up a bunch of like random two mana one ones to discard. So probably a build around C, but mostly going to be a C minus or a D plus even. Because it's just hard to get value out of. Because a lot of the creatures are just very interchangeable and limited. I guess it'll probably end up being like a C minus. If I had to guess, which I am, because these are all pretty much just educated guesses. I'm going to guess C minus. Next up is Vega the Watcher. This card's going to be a B. Fantastic card. There's so many foretell things. When you cast a spell from anywhere other than your hand means when you cast a spell from foretell pretty much. And there are going to be a lot of good foretell cards and you're going to be casting a lot of them. And so you're going to be able to get Vega the Watcher to draw you a card. I will say, if you have a foretell card that only costs like one mana to cast, waiting on your Vega until you can draw a card immediately is probably advisable so you can get that value. But you can also just run it out there, hope for the best, and then just start drawing like an extra card every other turn or something like that, which is just wild. So Vega is fantastic. It gets a B from me. And it can even be like as good as a B plus in the right deck. Next up, we are getting to the artifacts. We're nearing the conclusion of this marathon of a set review. Bloodline Pretender, just going to be a straight up C. Being a changeling is nice. Uh, you can just choose a creature type that you already have in your hand and make a three mana three three that only gets a little bit bigger over time. So it's just going to be rock solid C, I think. Next up is Colossal Plow. I think this card is like a D minus. This card strikes me as quite bad. A two mana six three with crew six is just too much. That's such a high crew cost. You're not going to be able to attack very well with it. And uh, hmm, yeah, and like the three mana and gaining three life is just so weird. It's so weird. I, I get the fact. It's kind of cute. It's like oh, it requires a lot of effort. Oh my gosh! I just realized this is the synergy piece with that ox. That white oxen. So my gosh, that's sweet. <laughs> oh my, because it's like the plow. I was like, what pulls the plow? It's like teamwork. That's why the crew is so high. But it's because there's that zero six ox that can crew vehicles. Oh my gosh, that is. Oh my gosh, my mind is blown. Well, if you have that oxen in your deck, oh, maybe this is just a build around. Maybe this is just a build around C, uh, C plus because if you have four copies of the oxen in your deck, so you go turn two plow, turn three play the oxen, crew, attack, gain three mana, cast a four drop. You're just living in dreamland. It's amazing. Um, so this is just the oxen card. But yeah, other than that, it's like a D minus. But I'm gonna be excited to see if that happens in any of my matches. It's probably gonna happen against me. My opponent's just gonna like destroy me with colossal plow but it'll be really funny when it happens so colossal plow i get the joke now let's go and now all of you get the joke as well so yeah i was like looking at this card i was like what the heck is this card i don't understand why is this a crew six that's so much but it's because the ox is in zero six that can crew things so yeah i'm gonna give this a, like a d minus but if you're building the build around ox deck then it's gonna be like a c plus awesome god card because you'll have like four oxen hopefully but yeah don't really put this card in most of your decks or really any of your decks unless you're trying to mess around and maybe it'll be good man i hope it's good that'd be really cool 
Next up is Funeral Longboat. I gave this card a C plus. It's like a two mana three three. Crew one is really easy to facilitate, and it's just a massive stat line. Um, it's pretty good for defense for being on defense too because your opponent won't be able to use sorcery speed removal a lot of the time uh, to deal with the three three because you'll just crew it mid combat. It's also cool because it can attack and defend. You like crew it with your small creature, attack for three, then you play another creature that you can crew it. Uh, it's also nice because if you have a creature and a longboat, you know you're going to be able to block. Because if they go for removal on your creature, you can crew a longboat in response. So you're going to have a blocker around. Uh, Vigilance is actually pretty nice on this. A 2 mana 3 3 vehicle is kind of small, but it's got a small crew cost, which makes it a little bit more reasonable. So I think it's probably going to end up being a C. Plus, uh, just because it's maybe not going to play out as a C plus like maybe it'll play out more like a C but the fact that you can always play this in your deck means that you can take this relatively early in a draft and feel pretty confident about it and be like okay with it so probably going to be like a C plus level card um but yeah next up is gold vein pick this card's not very good it's a little bit sad because I wish this card was a little bit better because then the runes could like be put onto it to make it better but generally, you're not going to be able to use Gold Vein Pick. It's going to be like a D or D minus level card. It's just so inefficient. If you have a bunch of runes and you just really need an equipment to put them on, I will say that like if Gold Vein Pick gives Death Touch because of the Death Touch rune, all of a sudden it becomes a lot better because you can just move Death Touch around for one mana, which is quite nice, and you can even get treasures to facilitate it. But generally, this card is going to be a D, and then maybe it gets a little bit better if you have some of the good runes to put on it. Um, because the runes do get a little bit better putting them on equipments. But I will say, Gold Vein Pick, probably just going to be a D uh, or D minus in most decks. And probably just going to be a D because it is, eh, yeah. It's a D minus. It's like Utility Knife from Zendikar Rising, but this is cheaper to equip. And it doesn't auto equip. So, probably just going to be a D minus. I don't see myself playing it a lot unless I have some a lunch, bunch of cool runes. Next up is Raider's Knit Carve. I gave this a D plus because Crew 3 is pretty meaningful, uh, but it is a pretty nice attacker and it can get you some card advantage. So if you have high powered creatures, you can take this as if it's a C minus or C level card, but it's harder than it looks to get Crew 3 going. So be wary. And I, that's why I'm starting this out of the D plus level card because it's harder to crew than it looks a lot of the time. Sorry, I need to pop my ears for some reason. Next up is Raven Wings. I give this card a C. I could see it being like a little bit better if you really care about the runes stuff again, because the rune stuff can be relevant. So you can get a little boost for that. But being a two mana way to get flying and plus one plus zero can be nice. So I think it's going to be a C. It's one of the equipments that's like relatively playable. And uh, the fact that there's some equipment synergies makes this a nice little addition to your deck. And giving flying plus a little bit of bonus power is really nice for helping you race your opponents. It is clunky though, so you're not going to want to play too many of this sort of effect in your deck. Uh, it's just nice to give your deck some reach or make your like green, big green creature have flying or something like that. Next up is Replicating Ring. I gave this a C as well. Maybe a C minus if you don't care about the snow element. But the fact that being a snow permanent can be beneficial means that this is going to be nice. And if you're fixing, if you're playing a deck that doesn't care about splashing, then this is just going to be like a D plus. But if you do care about ramping or splashing, then it's going to be like a C because it fixes for any color. It's a snow permanent. And then like it does put a timer on the game where getting eight snow artifacts can be really nice for like buffing up your like, just imagine you have the spirit of the Alder Bear. All of a sudden it's like, um, a uh, nine powered creature just because of your replicating rings, which is quite nice. Or you're just like pumping a bunch of mana into your your uh, troll uncommon, the red green one, or things like that. So replicating ring definitely has some potential. I think it's going to be a C in the decks that want it, or maybe a, uh, it's going to be a C in the decks that want it, and like a D plus in like some decks that are like looking for a marginal playable to ramp into their five or six drops. But generally, it's mostly going to be at home in a snow deck that's looking to splash because it's really good for enabling splashes in a snow deck. And uh, uh, hopefully it uh, performs there. It'll be a C level card in that deck because um, it gives you a free source of a splash color. Next up is Runed Crown. This is pretty cute with uh, the runes, but it's not very good overall um, because you need to have a couple of runes first of all to make this work. Because if you draw your rune first, the crown doesn't do anything. Um, but it does give you, like, if you do have a rune, then all of a sudden your rune crown is like a three mana for like a plus one plus one and flying rune, and it draws you a card. So it's not like, un not terrible that way. Um, but yeah, it's just a rune card. I was making sure it wasn't like any number of runes, because that'd be pretty wild. Or like multiple runes. But yeah, generally just going to be a little bit too clunky. I think it's going to end up being a D, because like drawing, like, it's essentially like drawing another rune, but the rune will then cost an extra mana. And has to, yeah. I just don't think it's very good. And the equip cost is two, 
which is a little bit expensive, and it only gets plus one plus one. So yeah, I'm gonna give this a, a C. Uh, I mean, a, a D for ruined crown. Sometimes you'll want it, I guess, if you have a couple of really good runes, maybe. Next up is Scorn Effigy. I'm going to give this a C. I think it has some nice synergy with Fortel stuff because you can just get a like nice 2-3 on your turn. Um, you're often just going to foretell this on turn 2, cast it on turn 3, and Bob's your uncle. But one of the things I like about it is that it can synergize with the black-white cast multiple spells in a turn archetype where you're going to be like, oh, I'm going to foretell this, and then I'm going to cast it and get a nice little bit of uh, value by having a zero mana spell. So in those decks, if you don't have a compelling reason to cast it, you might want to save it so you can get the cast second spell trigger from a card for zero, which is really nice. Uh, so score energy, I'm going to give it a C, but it does have that extra synergy in those decks. And in decks that don't really care about that, it's not really a card you're in love with, but it still has foretell, and there's some foretell synergy, so I think it's going to be a C. Next up is Weathered Runestone. This card is a constructed plant, uh, and so it's just an F in limited. Not really the type of card that you're interested in playing or sideboarding in. Okie doke, we're on to the lands section. We're almost done here. Oh, going to talk about these uncommon lands, and then we're going to talk about the snow lands a little bit. But yeah, Axe Guard Armory. This card is going to be a C plus. Uh, it's not going to be like if you have an equipment and an aura in your deck. Like even if it's the aura that like if it's the, even if you just have the aura that enchants your opponent's creature, then or a couple of those, it's going to be pretty good. But it's a little bit narrower. It costs five mana to search for like a couple of spells, but you might not have both of those spell types. So if you have an equipment and an aura, then this card goes up to B minus level because it's like a land that can eventually draw you two cards, which is quite good. So it's a B minus when you have those, but it's a little bit narrower. So um, if you only have like one type, it's going to be a C plus. Next up is Brittagard Stronghold. Uh, this card is very good. It's pretty cheap to use, um, even though you do sacrifice it. But in the mid game, you like can put counters on a couple of creatures, give them get a nice life gain swing. So this is going to be like a B minus. Next up is Gates of Istfeld. This is also going to be a B minus. It does cost six mana to use. I'm, when I'm saying six mana to use, I'm including the cost of tapping the card. So this, it only technically costs five mana, but then you have to tap this. So that's like six mana essentially. But gaining two and drawing two cards is exactly what you want out of your land in the mid game when you have too many lands. So Gates of Istfeld gets a B minus. Um, next up is Notvold Slumber Mound. This one costs seven mana to use, but making a 4-4 and destroying your opponent's land can also be pretty relevant. Um, sometimes you might even be able to destroy your opponent's utility land before they can sacrifice it themselves, which could be really nice. And uh, getting a 4-4 is going to be pretty reasonable in the mid-stage of the game like that, so I give this a B- minus as well, especially because red-green might have more ramp than you'd expect. Uh, or then you would get in a different color combo. Next up is Great Hall of Starnheim. This one's also really cheap to use, only costs four mana, and you get a 4-4 four, four white angel creature token with flying. This is the type of card that you might even use before you get to the mid game. Like if you just have five lands in play uh, and you don't have very many expensive cards in your deck, you could just make a 4-4. Four, four. So this card's really good. Uh, I think I also give it a B minus because the effect is, uh, I mean, it might even just be a B because it is so cheap to use. So yeah, I think I'm gonna give this one a B just because a 4-4 is just a huge impact on the game and it's a really cheap one to use. Next up is Immersturm Skullcairn. This one gets a C plus. It's better than a replacement level card, but dealing three to a player and making them discard in the mid game is gonna be a lot weaker, especially because they know you have the Skullcairn, so they're just gonna hold an extra land or something like that, or just not have anything in their hand. So the Skullcairn is gonna get a C plus, but because it does have some upside, dealing three to them is nice, but it's uh, not gonna be like as good as some of the other ones. Next up is Lityara Mirror Lake. This one also gets a uh, B minus. Just it's like a six mana uh, copy a creature and uh, get an extra counter on it, which is really nice. Um, it's like having an extra six drop in your deck almost because you're going to have it in your, in your land slot, and then eventually in the mid game you're going to copy one of your big creatures and be pretty happy with it. So pretty nice B minus there. Next up is Port of Carafel. Um, again, this one's pretty expensive. It costs seven mana. You mill four and then return a creature from your graveyard to the battlefield, but that's still going to be worth like the man in the mid game when you have a lot of lands in play you're just happy to be able to use these things to get a good effect and you're going to be able to get like a five drop a lot of the time by the time you have eight mana or what or seven mana or whatever so port of carfell is probably going to be a b minus as well just a nice another nice utility land most of the utility lands are b minuses with the one that a couple that are c pluses uh the red white one can be a c plus or a b minus depending or just not very good at all if you have no auras or equipments. I guess I failed to mention that option, but I assume that you're going to be able to get a couple auras or equipments for that red-white land. And then there's like the B-level one in the black land. Next up is Skemfar Elder Hall. Again, this one costs six mana to use. You can oftentimes kill a small creature, create a couple 1-1s, one -one, so this is going to be like a B-minus as well. Pretty nice card as well. Uh, pretty pretty cool design as well. It gets you some elves out. Next is Sirtland Frostpyre. 
This one's also interesting. It costs six to use. By the time you use this, a lot of the small creatures are going to be dead, but it is still really nice. The scry two is really relevant here. And it's also nice because there are going to be some matchups where your opponent is like going wide with a bunch of like small creatures. And then all of a sudden your like frost pyre land is just going to like wipe out their board while you get to keep a lot of your creatures. So this one's also going to be a B minus, I think. Moving on to another utility land slot, we have Shimmer Drift Veil. This is a snow land, but it can like be used to fix your mana. It can be used for any color, but only that color, and it enters tapped. So this one's going to be a C plus level card. Uh, you're going to take this over replacement level cards a lot of the time, uh, and even sometimes you'll take it over like pretty strong like other C plus level cards. It'll be in the conversation, just because if you're in a snow deck, especially one that's looking to splash, as I imagine a lot of snow decks might be trying to do. Um, because they're like more control -y decks that have like some green fixing potentially um then you can use this to like fix your mana and you can also just use this if you're like a red white deck not red white red white doesn't typically splash but let's say you're like a blue black deck that wants to splash a good white removal spell or a vega or something vega i think is the like foretell payoff card and that's the blue white one you can like pick up a couple shimmer drift veils and all of a sudden you have some extra sources of white mana that you don't have to really hurt your mana base that much to play. So this card's gonna be like a C plus, it's really good. And it's also a snow land, which is relevant for those cards. Next up is Alpine Meadow, um, but this is also gonna be in the conversation. It's gonna be uh, Arctic Tree Line, Glacial Floodplain, Highland Forest, Ice Tunnel, Rhinewood Falls, Snowfield Sinkhole, Sulfurous Mine, and Volatile For Fjord. I don't think that there is one after this. It's Woodland Chasm. I don't think there's one after Woodland Chasm. I think this is the last one. But these are all snow dual lands. They enter the battlefield tapped. They count as a swamp and forest or an uh, island mountain, all those things. And they are snow lands and they help your mana. So these cards are really quite good. I value these as a C plus as well, just like the card we looked at before, the Shimmer Veil, whatever the card, um, because they help fix your mana while also being a snow payoff. Um, the forest ones are also cool because they're cute because they work with that saga we looked at earlier that can go get a forest, but that's less of upside than just the fact that you get a dual land that makes your mana more consistent and also helps you with your snow payoffs. So those ones are very good because they work for two different purposes. They also they build up your snow count while also helping your mana, which is fantastic. So these are going to be valued pretty highly, I think, and you should treat them as like a C plus. You should take them over the replacement level cards. Finally, we're going to be looking at the snow land. So this would be snow covered island. I love this artwork, by the way. Uh, snow covered swamp. All these art artworks are great. But yeah, snow covered swamp, snow covered mountain. Snow covered forest. Look at the intricacy of the branches there. And snow covered plains. Um, look at it. It matches the background of the slide. But yeah, uh, these lands are all going to be pretty high picks. The way that snow lands work is they're like spell amplifiers. So if I have my frostbite card, if I have all of a sudden, if I have three snow lands, that spell does an extra damage. Or my, my, the bear, the four mana bear, all of a sudden that bear gets an extra three power because of my lands. And so you can treat these snow lands as if they're actual spells. So you should, instead of treating them as like a blank or like, oh, that's cute, they're, they're in a snow plane, you should actually treat them as like sea level spells. So you should, they should be actively in the conversation in your mind over like a sea level card because it's like, well, if your deck is going to be making it to 23 playables anyway, like it's better to have a like three, like five snow lands in your deck than five cards on the bench that you can't play. Um, like if you barely make playables, but you have all these snow lands, um, you're going to be in great shape because you're going to be able to get the snow payoffs. And it's even beneficial to take the snow lands before you have the snow payoffs because you can um, then use the, uh, you can then leverage the snow lands that you already have because other people won't be able to take the snow payoffs because they don't have the snow lands, but you'll have the snow lands. So you'll get past the snow payoffs a little bit later than you normally would. And there's a lot of really powerful snow payoffs, and so it's going to be really important to use those uh, snow lands properly. I will say that it seems like some colors use snow a little bit more than others. I think white uses snow a little bit less, um, but it looks like. But I think the other four colors are pretty evenly, and I think white also uses snow. I don't remember exactly um, off the top of my head. Um, how many snow cards are in each color, but I think they all use it to some degree And even if you are in a white deck that doesn't have any like white cards that use snow You could still be having like cards in your other color that care about the snow cards. So snow planes are still a valuable card um, But yeah, if it, some colors might care about snow less which will figure out as the format goes on But they're still gonna be valuable resources in your deck. They're like a, a way to use more of your picks in the draft They get to help you um, build up your mana base and make it more powerful than your opponents. And if your mana base is more powerful than your opponents, your spells don't like, and your spells are roughly equal, you're going to be favored in that matchup a little bit. But yeah, snowlands are going to be C's across the board. The snow basics and then the snow duels are going to be C pluses. But that is going to do it for this 
<laughs> limited set review. I really do hope you enjoyed it. It was really fun to make, and I uh, am hoping that you folks like this sort of thing. Remember that if you do make it all the way to the end of the video, hit that like button. Uh, it really does help me out. It's free to do. It lets people know. It helps other people find the video, and it lets uh, me know that you enjoy this sort of content, which is really good feedback. Uh, be sure to subscribe to the channel, and you can click that bell so you get notified when I post future videos. Uh, I'm going to be posting my a bunch of call time content now that the full set has been revealed, and uh, uh, if there's demand for it, maybe I'll even make a set review guide like this for the rares and mythics. Um, and I'm all, of course going to be making my call time draft guide, which you'll want to be able to catch. So hit that bell icon and subscribe to the channel and comment if you have questions or feedback. If there's a card that you would like more discussion of, uh, if there's a card that you didn't agree with my evaluation of, I would love to hear it. I'm always open to feedback and I like talking about the cards with you folks in the comments. And if you do make it all the way to the end of this video in the comments below, leave hashtag set review marathon to let me know you made it all the way till the end of the video. It's a great way to uh, let me know that you made it to the end, that you liked the video all the way to the end, uh, and uh, actually watched the whole thing. But yeah, that is going to do it for this video. I really do hope you enjoyed it. Enjoy it. I'm excited for call time. If you want to get access to my card-by-card -card grade spreadsheet, as I said, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash Nikolai Bolas at any level. Um, and uh, yeah, that's going to do it for this video. I really do hope you enjoyed it, and I will talk to you next time.